Strength is something most people yearn for, but in front of a master, most could not survive, as with only two faint slashes, their deaths are written. He wanted to be strong too, no matter who he faced. He wanted strength that persisted, no matter what. However, when he faced Zhang, the elder of the Mount Hua sect, who is the ultimate martial artist, he knew that he was nothing. He came to the Demon Academy just to become stronger. He withstood countless hardships over the years, but this only led him to the hands of death. In his last moments, he thinks that this is unfair. If only he had known better martial arts. If only his circumstances were a little better. As his breath becomes baited and his vision blurry, something appears in front of him, a screen, who asks if he wants to resume, load, or simply restart. His consciousness begins fading away, but as it did so, he only thought of one thing, about how he wanted to live. Subconsciously, he chose to restart. He will return before the private meeting with the Lord of the Supreme Court. As the man slowly wakes up in a strange place, he thinks that his name is Seol Hui. In order to understand and learn the demonic arts, which already reduce one's lifespan, he entered the Demon Academy, but he did not learn any arts for years. All he did was mostly lead reconnaissance missions, and then, he just died. As he fades away into a deep sleep again, Seol notes that his life truly was worth nothing. He suddenly wakes in a cold sweat, and when he opens his eyes, he is met with the ceiling he has seen for years. He gets up in surprise, as he recognizes this place. It's the old training facility. His mind is too entangled to make sense of this, but he is sure that he died when he met the Mount Hua sect leader. Was he just dreaming? He has more things to worry about now though. Like how the Mantis, Lord of the Supreme Court, sent him to only survey the vicinity while the Vice Principal did the actual mission. He groggily walks around the facility, until someone from behind notes that he didn't expect to see him here. This is Juk Myung, and next to him is someone even worse, a member of the Black Moon Squad, which is the direct unit of the Supreme Court, Chik San. Seol doesn't know what he wants, but San suddenly punches him so hard that it sends him back. He apologizes for doing that, his hand just slipped a little there. But is he really walking around here? As the leader of the Flying Faction Squad, half asleep? How can he dare to do such a thing in front of the Black Moon Squad Captain Juk Myung? Seol resists the pain, as more important than pain, is the fact that he has seen this situation before. He knows that he has. If he is right, then San will next say that if he's lacking in skill, he should at least bow his head as deep as he can. Sure enough, San does just that, making Seol's heart race even faster. Myung calls him a fool while looking at him, and Seol asks what he wants. Myung explains that the Lord of the Supreme Court has summoned him. He should go while he is still merciful. Additionally, he would also like to say that he's an extremely lucky bastard. Seol doesn't know what that means and slowly gets up while cursing San for being a bastard. He's only going this far because Myung is backing him, even though he's actually lower ranked than he is. Just once, he hopes that he slips up so he can end his miserably bald life. Since that won't happen right now, he can now wonder what the things above their heads mean. Not for long thought, as he has to go to the Supreme Court Lord as fast as possible. As he does that, he gets a strange feeling. Everything is going the way he remembers. But just what happened? Perhaps this is a dream. Perhaps this is foresight. That's not it. It feels far too real. It's as if something even stranger happened. He arrives at the court lord and asks for permission to come in. But what's on his mind is that he really came back to his past when he died. Unfortunately enough, he is now also meeting the one who planned his death, the Mantis. Everything happened because of this old bastard. Seol introduces himself and explains that he came here to receive orders. He remembers this situation exactly. The current leader of the court of the holy deity was also present. There's a place called the Red Demon Chamber which was the first branch of the Demonic Academy. Within it, there are five courts, and the court leaders possess amazing martial arts skill. But the Mantis in particular has the Demonic Flame, which is capable of melting bone and flesh in a single burst. Because of his rather awful personality, he would use this ability to kill mindlessly, particularly those he did not like. Even though this guy is someone Seol cannot trust, he has no choice but to obey the chain of command. The Mantis tells the Holy Deity court leader that this is the child he was talking about before. He starts looking Seol up and down before saying that he does indeed seem as powerful as he mentioned, but his greeting lacked finesse. It's like he did it as a chore, not out of respect. Seol immediately falls to his knees and apologizes for his actions. He had simply wished to offer his greeting and nothing more. The Mantis tells the holy deity leader to not go as far on this poor child. If he scolds others in such a manner things will turn around to him and make him look like a tyrant. Seol apologizes again. He does not know how to act in front of such grace. In his mind, however, he curses the Mantis, as he told him just four days ago to greet his guests like this. He did it on purpose. The Mantis commands him to rise, and asks what his thoughts are about becoming the clerk of the Kianil office. Seol doesn't know how to respond, but he knows that this bastard is finally showing his true colors. 
The Mantis says that he expressed much interest in the demonic arts, so he took extra care of this. Seol knows that this is just bait, as the Cheon Il office is a place that has thousands of classified books, but this bastard will never give him access. He notes that he wanted to give him another mission, more well suited to his skills. Seol knows that the mission he will send him on is the one he died in. He will send him once again to the Mount Hua sect outpost with nothing but a flimsy knife. Perhaps this opportunity was given to him by the heavens, so he will not waste this opportunity. He will not die again. Before he says what he has on his mind, a system message pops up, giving him three choices on what to do in this situation. Seol also notices that he cannot move his body at all, and time has stopped completely. He once again thinks that this is a dream, but it cannot be. He went back in time after death, and knows that something similar appeared then. He also sees that one number below is decreasing slowly, which means that he must choose within that time limit. Since he is rushed, he tries to think of the best option here, which is not to cut his own arm off, as he will probably die, so he chooses to wish for another order. Just as if nothing happened, Seol says that he wishes for another order, to everyone's surprise, including him, as he knows that what he just said is blasphemous. The Mantis angrily gets up. How dare he ask for another order when he has yet to give him one? He is truly impertinent, and will be punished as such. The entire room erupts in the Mantis's bloodlust, and Seol can feel his ability. The demonic flame is surfacing. It feels like his throat is bitten. He's seriously messed up. Before he can think of anything else, Seol feels like he's about to die. He can feel his neck being blown out. However, the Mantis suddenly screams at the attacker to stop, and the masked lady who was about to take Seol's life stops in her tracks. He knows that if the Mantis did not speak earlier, he would have completely lost his neck. He did not have time to even react. He only realized what was happening after it happened. He also knows that this woman is the vassal who guards the Supreme Court Lord with her life if need be. Huk B. The Mantis sits back down and tells Seol that he will hear him out. But whether he kills him or spares him, he will decide afterwards. Seol falls to his knees again and asks not to be misunderstood. When he asked for another order, it was not because he wanted to choose that order. The Mantis asks what he meant then, so Seol explains that recently, he heard rumors about the Mount Hua sect gathering around the borders of Hanam. Seol knows that in the end, the Mantis will only spare him if he dances to his tune, so he notes that he always says, getting rid of the Mount Hua bastards is their homework, and duty. The Mantis asks what if he does, so Seol screams that he wishes to take that opportunity. His flying faction squad specializes in reconnaissance and surveillance. If he blesses him with the current professor's expedition period, he will join it in a heartbeat. The Mantis ponders his request for a while, but as Seol prays that everything will be alright, the holy deity leader laughs. It seems that this information spread out from the Falcon Heaven Court to the core, otherwise a mere squad leader like him would not have access to it. The Mantis looks at Seol and tells him that it's amusing, he was going to assign him to that place anyway. The location he just mentioned will be searched by the vice principal, so before then, they should have someone survey the terrain closely. In case he goes, he should survey the kind of people around the area, and the land in particular. He shall do so closely, and then hand the information to his betters. Seol swears he shall obey that command, so the Mantis excuses him out. Seol cannot believe that he managed to live, and looks at B, before leaving with sweat coming down his brow. Once again he sees something above her head, but he does not know what it means. Four more lives? He goes to a nearby pond to wash his face, as the things that just transpired are unbelievable, even if he lived them. It seems that this is truly real life, but just what is happening to him? Above his head there is also a notification. One coin, his last chance at life. As he walks away, he remembers the Mantis's orders, and thinks that he's truly shameless. He knows that after they go, nobody else will, so they have nowhere to retreat to. Now, what does he do? Should he just run away as far as he can? That will be just as hard though, because he learned the demonic arts, so he always has a wicked and unpleasant energy to him, something he cannot hide. He is sure that the other Murum soldiers will sense his energy and make an example of him by letting him die like a dog. In the end, no matter how hard he thinks about it, he only sees death in his path. Suddenly, San who was sitting on a nearby rock notes that he must have received an important order to be making that face. He really messed up while talking to the Supreme Court leader. He better be cautious from now on. He feigns ignorance suddenly. He actually didn't see him. He was just mumbling to himself, although he doesn't really care if he heard or not. Seol sees that San is only worth one life. Surprising considering how much of a rat he is, but this offers him a chance. He has to choose, whether he follows the order and dies, or chooses to live. He starts approaching San out of nowhere, as he wants to confirm something with him. San immediately gets scared, and Seol stops his approach, the tension between them rising even higher. Seol suddenly grabs his blade and rushes San, who barely had enough time to unsheathe his own blade in order to block. He asks Seol what he's even doing, 
but Seol does not elaborate and continues attacking San again and again, until he leaves himself exposed, allowing Seol to cut his leg. Seol notes that he said he messed up back there, but he did it to get some much-needed answers. Yet he could not find out a damn thing, even after risking his life. He continues his onslaught with the Seven Swords technique, something that San can barely block. Even then, he only survives from sheer luck. After distancing himself, he asks Seol if he's crazy. Does he think that everything will just go back to being fine after he did what he just did? Unfortunately for him, Seol no longer cares about things being normal, so he charges in and pushes even harder. He did everything to get to this point, so he will not stop at all. In order to not die again, he would do anything, even if it meant killing someone. San tries to retaliate, but Seol dodges and uses his momentum to kick San in the gut, dealing a major blow to him. Seol is betting on the icon above San's head. That might be the only way for him to survive. It has to be, as there is no other way for him. The leaves stop rustling as Seol prepares his final strike. San can see the determination on his face, and tries to tell him that if Myung finds out about what he just did, there will be hell to pay. Nearby, a crow, a messenger of death, looks in their direction. Seol impales San in the chest with no remorse, killing the bastard in an instant. He always wanted to do something to him. Perhaps this is too much, but at this point, he cannot turn back from his actions. After some time passes, Seol throws the wrapped up body of San into a river, fated to forever stay there. As soon as he killed him, the words above his head vanished. However, he felt like nothing changed. He became scared that he did this for nothing. But now, as he looks at his reflection in the water, he sees the icon above him change. He has been given a second chance. The next day, Seol moves with his team through a steep cliff, which combined with the strong torrents, provides the most optimal space to move discreetly. In the end, he could not escape the Mantis's order and had to come here. If he's honest, this might be better, since Myung would have killed him anyway if he stayed at the academy. They eventually arrive at their designated spot, and Seol takes another glance at his reflection in the water, still seeing two coins he has. Even though he thinks he knows what this means, he's still scared to test it out. This is his only chance after all. The captain of the squad, Chol Su Jin, beckons Seol over, which he immediately responds to. She notes that there are groups of Mount Hua sect in the area, so moving carelessly will provide him with a swift death. All he must do is determine the number of enemies in the local terrain, then return. Seol understands her orders but wonders why she's not moving directly. She's a captain that manages three squads after all. Seol does as he is told, and tells the others to follow, while the Jin just looks at them. As Seol runs with the team, he thinks about this situation, something he couldn't afford to do in the past. This whole entire mission is puzzling. He was forced to take an order from the Mantis, or die right there and then. He orders everyone to follow him, as he's going to make a right, which the group members are surprised by. They were supposed to go to the left after all. Even so, they cannot disobey a superior's commands, so they follow. Seol did this because the Hua bastards attacked them when they arrived at their destination. This time though, he will not let everyone get hunted down like dogs. He did not enter the academy, and went through that hellish training just to end up dead. He wonders if the second chance above his head is real. Does it mean that he will revive after he dies? He suddenly sees something, making him signal the others to stop. They have arrived at what seems like an outpost, and the team members wonder what Seol will do. Is it possible that someone saw them come here? Seol knows that Doubt will be their killer, and since these guys are starting to doubt him because of how he evaded their real destination, he tells them that he will go inspect on his own, although he waits for their backup if something happens. Seol gets close to the building, noting that it must be some type of watch post, which will likely only have one or two normal soldiers, someone he can easily kill. However, if the Swordmaster is here, he will die. He takes a peek inside the building, and what he sees inside seems to shock him. Eventually, he signals the squad members to come down, and he explains that nobody is inside, but his face is betraying something. He wonders what to do now. Probably get reinforcement from the academy, but going back there now might prove fatal. One team member asks another if he also thinks that the squad leader is acting strange, which he agrees with. Something surely must have happened. The team member speaking with Seol notes that they should get out of the way before someone comes and finish their job. Seol tries to come up with something, but in the end, he couldn't come up with anything. He looks at his squad member's face, and knows that he only has to wait, until the pop-up appears again. Sure enough, he's once again faced with three choices, but they all lead to a meeting with the enemy, something that confuses him to no end. He has neither seen nor heard them, even their presence is lost to him, but time is running out, so he must choose as quickly as he can. If the enemy is really here, and it's someone who can hide their presence, they can't run or fight anyway. The only choice here is to talk with them. The scenario continues, and Seol suddenly tells someone to come out of hiding, which immediately gets everyone on high alert. Yet after seconds pass, nothing happens. 
Seol thinks that the pop-up was just written strangely, and sighs relieved, but that's when someone appears, and notes that he is quite the capable man. Everyone immediately backs away from the mysterious man, and Seol wonders how and why he is meeting this guy again. He is the ultimate martial artist that represents strength, the peak swordsman who carries the plum blossom blade, the elder of the Mount Hua sect, Gu Zhong Myung. He looks at Seol and says that by his expression alone, he can see that he recognizes him. This guy is the number one enemy of the entire Demon Academy, so why is he meeting him again here? They kept moving south after arriving at the middle gate. He went as far as ordering his teammates to a place that they had no place being in. So just why is he here? Zhang does not understand why he is asking that question. Are they not the ones who are rudely trudging while in his patrol area? Seol cannot believe his luck. How is this guy's patrol area? Zhang notes that he does not wish to delay further. He does not know what brings them here. However, he can tell just by their clothes that they are from the disgusting Demon Academy. He will not practice forgiveness with unforgivable creatures. Tonight is the day they die. Everyone on the team gets ready to fight in their own way, but Seol already knows. There is no way to beat him. They will all just die like in his past life. The result will be the same, but somehow, he refuses to give up hope. Even though his life has been uneventful up until now, he has still hoped for more. Something more than just this. He has told himself that he will not die tonight, and he plans to listen. So he orders everyone to retreat as fast as they can. When they hear his command, everyone starts running in different directions, before meeting up once again and running in formation. Zhang is quite annoyed by the fact that they are such slowpokes, and cuts them all down to size, and impales Seol from behind. He certainly didn't expect for them to be so weak, but since their leader is such a worthless buffoon, it is no wonder. There's nothing else to be said about it. With bated breath, Seol notes that he knew, which Zhang inquires about. Seol says that he knew that they were coming, otherwise this ambush wouldn't make any sense. Zhang asks if he's gone crazy from the blood pouring out of him, but suddenly yanks his head closer and asks how he knew. He should tell him now, while he can still give him an easy death. At this moment, a single thought rose to Seol's mind. The ability to deduce things beyond common sense. This guy knew what day, and even at what time they would arrive. A normal human being wouldn't have been able to do all of these things, unless they knew beforehand. Zhang feels pity for such a fool, and notes that since he already knows, he will tell him this. One side benefits by becoming much more efficient, while the other by getting rid of some dirty little rats. It's not a bad deal for either side, right? Now that he is looking at him more carefully, he has certainly caught his eye. He's a demonic cultivator, who dared to protest against his betters. Zhang suddenly stops speaking, as he sees Seol cry, tears of blood red, filled with rage and the will to survive. Zhang didn't expect to see a wielder of demonic energy cry ever, but whatever. He is thankful to him, as he can now increase his ever-growing skills. This is goodbye, but he should feel honored to die by his hand, as the squad leader. Seol begs whoever is listening to spare his life. Dying like this is not fair. All he needs is one more chance at life. As his head falls, Seol arrives in the same dark spot, and the pop-up message gives him three options. Seol immediately focuses, and thinks that he cannot start from the beginning again, as he cannot guarantee that things will go the way they did again, so he chooses to load a save point, only to find that there are no save files inside. The system tells him as such too, so in a fast turn of events, he chooses to resume, but it cannot be executed, since the martial artist he is facing is much stronger than his and the scenario cannot be completed by conversation. The system shows him Zhang, and all of the statistics he has, while also showing him, and reveals that he does not have even a quarter of what Zhang possesses. Seol knows now that there is no chance for him to defeat that guy, so with another warning from the system and no other choice, he restarts. Seol wakes up once again to the same white tiled roof, and begins laughing. Is he really this unlucky? Well, this is still a second chance, so he has to get up and move on. He cannot stay here, because those two will arrive soon enough, and mess with him again. When San and Myung arrive, San is surprised that Seol is not in his bed, as he saw him just a few minutes ago. Seol is behind them, and looks at San's head, which seems to not have that notification anymore. This probably means that he can collect a life only once from each person, and since he has no real easy targets around here, he only has one chance left at life. This does not bring him despair, however. Instead, he clenches his fist and thinks of strength. He has to be stronger. Stronger than Myung. Stronger than the Mantis. Stronger than the master of the Hua sect. He will survive, no matter what may happen. Seol goes on a run to clear his mind just for a little while, but stops right at a mirror, seeing that he only has a chance left. He sits next to the wall and wonders what to do. There are enemies at every angle. Enemies he cannot fight nor avoid completely. There must be a way for him, so he gets going once again. When he goes to meet the Mantis, Seol bows down with extreme force and announces what he came here for. The Mantis looks at him, while Seol thinks that the system told him about the incident with the Mantis, 
so there has to be some way for him to get what he wants in this place, so he will not run away no matter what. The Mantis introduces Seol to the holy deity leader, who notes that he must be a good kid to bow down so gracefully. Seol notices that the situation is much different from before. Perhaps it's because of his bowing that the Mantis couldn't do anything now. The Mantis asks what he thinks of becoming the clerk of the Sheon Eel office, which Seol now knows is a trap. He raises his head before bashing it into the ground. He does dare to ask for such a valuable position. It does not suit a person as lowly as himself. The Mantis is surprised by the reaction, but it's great, as he wanted to give him a mission anyway. That's when Seol interrupts him, and notes that he wishes to say something to him. He has been waiting for this moment, for the three options to pop up again. He already knows that the first two choices lead him to imminent death, so the only option for him is the third one, to cut off his right arm. He says as such, which feels really weird for him, but if this does not work, then he has no other way of escaping. The Mantis asks why he would do such a thing, and why so suddenly. Seol cannot avoid fate, so he would rather do everything with his own hands. He explains that he was always watching over him, yet he dared to yearn for upper-level martial arts and continued speaking out of line. He even went to look through his things with no fear. All these thoughts suddenly came to him, and they brought great shame. Killing him multiple times would not be adequate, so he would like to prove his loyalty to him. The holy deity finds him amusing, and the mantis hands him a small blade. If he's so adamant on doing it, then he should get started, right? Seol picks up the blade with a certain tremor in his actions, but he only has to do this once. This is the only way for him to survive. With that, he begins cutting, deeper and deeper until blood sprays out of him like a fountain. The mantis orders him to stop, and B rushes to knock the blade out of his hand in an instant, falling behind him. Seol looks at her and wonders when she even did it, seeing the plus four lives he can get from her. He also notices that he didn't cut his arm enough to cause long-lasting damage, but at the same time he also can't move it. The mantis points at him and notes that he is quite amazing, with the holy deity leader agreeing. Seol breathes heavily while the two make fun of him, but the mantis suddenly hands him a token. He always wanted to lead the Xionel office after all, right? So this is his chance to do it. Seol can't believe that he survived. Out of all of these actions, this one was actually the winner. He thanks the mantis for his grace and takes his leave. With this action, he has confirmed that these options are his only path to his survival. As he hears the two laughing, he vows to never forget the pain they have incurred on him and their ugly faces. Later at the Cheon Il Tower, Seol is inspected by the secretary, who asks how old he is and how much experience he has. Seol says that he's 27 and has 8 years of experience in the Flying Assassin Squad. The secretary also sees that at his basic instruction institution, he was ranked 12th out of 1,000 kids, which surprises him. He never expected to see such a high rank in such a place. While analyzing him, the secretary notices his arm being strained and asks what happened to it. Seol notes that there's been an accident, and before he can wonder what kind, he notices the Mantis's signature on his invitation, so he will not stick his head into this problem. He tells Seol to follow, and they both go through a dark hall before arriving at a library. The secretary notes that he will work here from now on. All he must do is maintain the books and properly organize them. The secretary notices the lack of response and asks what's wrong, but Seol understood. He was just mesmerized. While the secretary continues explaining, Seol thinks that the Mantis and Holy Deity leader might not know this, but all of this classified information is managed by librarians and government offices who have unclear intentions. There is no way that they classified high-level martial arts here, but he does not need such skills anyway right now. Now, he is looking for a way to kill the man in front of him, to secure a lifeline, and get one more life. Even if he messed this one up, he would have something to save him. He wonders how much a secretary knows about martial arts, and suddenly calls him over before trying to pull something out of his clothes with a desperate look on his face. As the secretary was turning around, Seol wondered if he could win against him, as his right arm is basically useless for the moment. Since Seol does not have the luxury of doing otherwise, he lunges forward and stabs the secretary in the belly, who naturally becomes freaked out and kicks him away. Seol knows that the stab wasn't deep enough, but also knows that since this guy is only worth a single life, he's at the same strength level as San. The secretary holds his wound while asking if he's insane, but Seol pays him no mind and charges forward. As the longer he waits, the surprise will wane off the secretary. He must finish quickly. Unfortunately for him, the secretary sees an opening in his attacks and grapples him, putting him to the ground with a loud thud. In this state, the secretary is quickly able to get the upper hand and end the life of this crazed man with a single strike of his blade. This is what Seol thinks will happen if he tries to do something in his current state. So when the secretary asks what it is, he meets him with a warm smile. It is nothing of consequence. 
He just wanted to hand him this as a token of appreciation for the work they are going to do together. And since it's getting cold and he has been working so hard, he thought that this would warm him up. The secretary seems suspicious at first, but then swiftly grabs the money and notes that he's quite sociable for someone with such a gloomy face. If there's anything he wants to know, he should just ask. He will also leave him with a piece of advice. For his sake, he should not stand out. He will certainly live longer, since there are a lot of monsters around these parts. Seol already knew that, and he promised himself that he would survive, to get revenge on those who had wronged him so far. Now though, he should focus on his small objective, that being killing the secretary. Time passes as Seol is stuck in the depths of the library, organizing countless books and placing them where they are supposed to be. But out of nowhere, he finds a strange book called Exx Core. He opens it, reading that XX means to flow, and core means deep, but what's so deep about it? When he reads a little closer, he sees what kind of deep it is, and stashes it in his clothes for later use. At the same time, the system asks what kind of martial arts skill he wishes to master, which surprises Seol, but that's when he notices the glowing book in the myriad of other books. Since time has not stopped, he picks up the book, and sees that it's a textbook called The Three Primary Excellences. Upon picking it up, the system asks what skill he wishes to marshal, providing three choices for him, white fluorescent, fiery hand, or convening final martial arts. Seol is shocked, but even more shocked that the convening final martial arts is here. It is an art that the Mantis mastered, and is recognized by the Academy as a top-grade martial art. Fiery is also a famous martial art, mastered by former Vice Principal Cal Yom Gi when he was here. Seol is amazed with his find, but they all seem to be blocked, so he checks an art just to be sure. The system does indeed say that he cannot master the art because of his injury, but it's fine, as he has other options. He did not hear of the white fluorescent martial arts before, but since it's among two famous martial arts, it must be strong. Upon choosing it, Seol is presented with three ways of training the art. Sword skills, combat skills, or fighting footwork skills. Seol decided that if he can master these, he need not hold back, so he chooses sword skills first, which provides him with a demonstration. Seol wonders what that means, but suddenly a mystical force rises up and a shadow appears, which immediately begins moving with the purpose of showing him. Seol can see that from its posture, all the way to its footwork, the white frost coming from its mouth is also trying to teach him how to breathe. Seol watches mesmerized, as the shadow perfectly demonstrates the movements of the white fluorescent martial arts. The system also presents him with the skill set, great ship sword, and the movements required to do it. Even though Seol does not recognize the character below, he knows one thing. He gets up and picks his blade up, as this is an opportunity for him to learn and to try again. Even though he doesn't know why this is happening to him, he will take advantage of it fully, for revenge and for his survival. With this opportunity, killing Secretary Hong becomes a possibility, so he will perfect this martial art in earnest. Seol continues to learn and practice until he is able to rip a pretty sizable hole in the wooden structure of the library and deal a precise attack to the stone wall behind it. One month has passed since he began his studies, and now he is on his way to master hand-to-hand -hand combat and footwork. He does not need the demonstration anymore since he has memorized all of the moves in a few days. Because he learned swordsmanship first, learning the footwork was pretty easy. However, no matter what he tried, he couldn't understand how to use the great ship sword. He decided to read the notice display, and while he could understand the words, he could not understand the directions of the movements. He notes that it would be pretty good to also know how to use the great ship sword. But if he's honest, he's glad that he got the fluorescent martial art in the first place. With it, the opportunity to kill Secretary Hong has become real. He relishes in the idea for a while, before remembering that he's in charge of this part of the library, so he should start cleaning up before someone comes and sees what he did. After that he returns to his rather boring job, or organizing the books, and picks up a basic skills book while he's at it. Perhaps it will make him improve his martial art. That's when someone from behind notes that he didn't expect to see someone here, and when Seol looks behind, his eyes become filled with fear. He does not recognize the man in front of him who asks if there's something wrong with his face, but he remembers what Secretary Hong said. Monsters truly lurk around here, as this guy has plus ten lives to give. Seol apologizes and says that it's nothing with the man saying that such courtesy is not needed. He asks what he should call him, and Seol introduces himself while bowing. He thinks that B, who guards the legendary Mantis, had four lives to give, but this guy has a total of ten lives, meaning that he must be extremely powerful. The man asks what he's doing in such a place, and Seol explains his order of organizing the bookshelves and keeping them tidy. The man understands, but if he's working here, he would like to know one thing. There is a book he holds precious, close to heart, as some would say. Has he ever seen a book called the Three Primary Excellences Textbook? 
Seol's expression betrays that he has the book right in his very hands, and the system forces him to choose from two options this time. Either he lies, or tells the truth about him mastering the martial arts. Seol can't believe that he's put on notice again. However, he doesn't have time to cry about it, so he must decide well. If not, he will die right here. He wonders why he ever picked up this cursed book, and what these options even are. He certainly can't tell him that he mastered the martial arts, but he also can't lie to him, as he has the book right in his hands. Neither choice provides him with salvation. Seol goes slowly insane as the countdown continues to tick, and since there's no more time, he will choose the least terrible option. He lies and says that he has never seen that book, which surprises the man, but he leaves, wondering to himself where he left it. Seol lets out a huge sigh, however, to make sure that nothing happens. He tells the man that he will help him search for it, who agrees to his help. It's been a while since he has been here after all. Seol smiles and follows him with bad posture. He couldn't care less about appearances now, especially since he was almost met with sure death once again. The man suddenly claps his hands and notes that he finally remembered where he left it. Seol asks where, and the man slowly turns around. It's right in his dirty little thief hands. Seol clenches the book even harder and wonders if he's really been caught. As the man slowly approaches, Seol's heartbeat grows. His eyes become diluted from fear, as the only thought on his mind is what's going to happen to him. He knows that it's impossible to run away from this monster. Should he just play the fool once again and pray that it works? Before successfully saying something, the man suddenly begins laughing out loud. He was just joking. He was having a little fun. He apologizes for his rude behavior, and notes that he must not know who he is. He is known as Bu Il Gi. It is so very nice to meet him. With the greetings done, Gi says that he will go browse the different books around here. Seol doesn't know what to think anymore. Was that laugh fake, or was it really sincere? Just who is the man in front of him? After some time passed, while Gi was silently reading his books, he suddenly asked if he came here by the Supreme Court Lord's recommendation, which Seol confirmed was because of his grace that he was able to be here. Gi didn't expect that old fart to do something like this. He's not the type to ask for favors after all. Seol notes that he actually treats him well. He's not that bad. Gi doesn't believe him. He's treating him so well that he made his right arm, which is crucial to the Murim world, completely and utterly useless. Seol certainly didn't expect for him to know all of this and Gi suddenly apologizes. He didn't mean to background check him, but he was curious about his identity. Hey, at least it's not his neck that was cut off. It's better to roll around in the mud here in the real world rather than the next one. He should also just give up trying to learn any new martial arts if he hasn't. It's a pointless venture at this point. Seol is getting quite annoyed, as this guy who doesn't even know him is talking smack. Besides that, for him to call the legendary Mantis an old fart, he must be someone powerful to dare tempting fate like that. Gi says that he probably doesn't recall. Who among the younger people around here can call the Mantis an old fart, right? Seol wonders if this bastard has a mind-reading ability, but he says that he doesn't. He does not dare to make assumptions about anyone. G tells him that assumptions are human nature, but more importantly, he wants to know about the white fluorescent martial arts. How much has he mastered from it? Seol's sweat becomes thickened, as he thinks that this bastard is just trying to test him. So he lies and says that he does not know what he is talking about. G inches closer, and asks if that is the truth. Seol confirms as such, he cannot use his right arm anymore. So how can someone like him, with a crippled body, dare to try and master any martial art? G laughs as he understands where he is coming from, though he does not need to be so serious. However, in the case that he was lying to him all of this time, that means that he would be a deceiver. He doesn't like deceivers at all. Sale's sweat becomes too heavy and falls to the ground, just as Guy is leaving and wishing him success in his job. Seol can finally relax. His heart certainly can't take many of these situations, but unfortunately for him, Guy stops dead in his tracks, and a system pop-up appears, forcing him to choose out of three options. Seol is shocked to see the first one. He didn't know this man was the disciple of the heavenly demon. The fourth one at that, he only heard about them in rumors. G is ranked 30th within the demon academy. The person at the top of the martial arts game, he is a true beast. Seol's breath becomes even faster as he looks at the options he has. Choosing the second one is out of the question. He cannot tell him that he mastered the fluorescent martial arts, as he would be a deceiver. And the third option seems to be even worse. So without much choice, he has to choose the first option. Upon hearing what he just said, Ji's eyes light up and note that he isn't bad. He does not know how he found out, but it does not change much. In the end, he is just a person who is pushed out in the middle of a power struggle. Seol immediately falls to his knees and asks to be forgiven for his actions. He never dared to disrespect him in any way. Seol thanks the heavens that he made the right decision. Now though, if Gi is in a position where he couldn't be found out, it would spell doom for him. Fortunately, Gi turns back and tells him to get back to work. Seol's pulse returns back to normal. Before time stops again, 
and the pop-up appears again, with the two other choices. Seol doesn't know why this is happening. He already made the selection earlier. Now he has to do it again. He grits his teeth and damns it all before choosing the first option and telling the whole truth to him. Gi didn't expect for him to lie, but it means that he has deceived him. He already warned him about what he does with deceivers. He jumps in the air and asks if he has a death wish while unsheathing his blade. At the same time, the system pop-up appears once again, just in time for the blade to be stopped at Seol's neck. Now he only has one choice, and 500 seconds to decide if he's going to do it or not. As the seconds tick down, Seol looks at Gi's expression, one of focus. He can see that he doesn't intend to stop at all. At this point, he has no choice, and is being forced to choose the worst choice out of all of them. Now that he looks closer, he can see the huge timer that he's been given, even though he only has one option left to choose. It is as if the system is giving him enough time to find the purpose of these questions. Since he has so much time, there must be a way out of this predicament, with the only obstacle standing in his way being figuring out what this question means. Since it's forcing him, this must be the best decision. But how so? A heavenly demon disciple is pointing his blade at him and preparing the most powerful attack he has seen in a while. There must be a way to convince him to stop. What can he do though? That's when he remembers something interesting. Ji's way of speaking about the mantis, which didn't seem favorable at all. He also seems mighty disinterested in power, but are the words he told him true? It seems that this question isn't as foolish as he previously thought. Gi, just like him, strives for strength more than anyone. He can understand him. Since it is like that, now he can be his strength, and that can perhaps soothe his mighty rage. The countdown continues to tick, as Seol remembers Zhang's words, which betrayed that he interacted with someone from the Demon Academy who had some position, and the only person he can think of is that bastard, the Mantis. With only 32 seconds left to spare, Seol prays that what he's about to do will work. He chooses the final option, which stops Gi dead in his tracks, and he seems quite disgusted by what Seol just said. He explains that he couldn't close the gap between him and the other Heavenly Demon disciples, so when the Heavenly Demon made his decision, the other disciples already set the stage to gather support for them, meaning that it must have been hard for him, no matter what he tried. Gi tells him to not change the subject so quickly, and what's he trying to say anyway? Seol is amazed that he's listening to him. He can see that he's quite curious about his words. With this opportunity, Seol tells him to choose the Lord of the Supreme Court as his stage. Gi is surprised by this, and the murderous look in his eye changes, something that Seol immediately notices, and allows him to go even further. The Supreme Court is the center of the Red Demon Palace, and if he gets it, it will become a big asset for him. He will be able to occupy the Red Demon Palace and fulfill his reason for coming here in the first place. Gi looks at him for a bit, before withdrawing his blade, allowing Seol to speak even more. Did he not come here to look for the Three Primary Excellences textbook? If he had found it, he would have left. He had been thinking about it too. What was the reason for a disciple of the Heavenly Demon to come to such a shabby place anyway? Why would he speak to the lowest of the low and allow himself to receive help from him? He realized something after thinking like that. He must have come here to find somebody who can tell him the weakness of the Mantis. Gi asks why he thinks that way, and Seol explains that the Mantis had ordered the Flying Assassin Squad to carry out a search and recon mission. Was it truly just a coincidence that only he was removed from that squad? Seol thinks that if he repeated the past, everyone in the Flying Assassin Squad would have died, so Gi must have heard the rumors. If that had happened, there would have been no reason for him to come here. Even if he did come, there would be no reason to pay him no mind. Seol knows that Gi thinks of him as an unusual person. Gi laughs out loud because of his words. He is truly amusing. He can understand why the Mantis does not like him. In any case, is he implying that he is able to provide him with that weakness? Seol confirms as such, so Gi asks him to spit it out, yet Seol remains silent. Gi asks if he was just spouting nonsense. Can he not think of anything to lie about? Seol bows down and asks, if he provides him with what he wishes, what would he gain in return? Gi becomes confused, as he didn't think he'd have the gall to ask for something. Seol feels it's only natural. He put his life on the line, so if there is something he can gain, then he should be able to get it. Gi asks if he truly thinks his life is worth anything, which Seol knows it's not, but the information he may provide him will save some time and effort on his part. Is that not enough? Gi ponders his proposal for a little bit and agrees. If the information he gives him is as useful as he says, he vows to reward him amply. Seol takes a deep breath before answering and says that Hua's sect elder, Zhang, is the Mantis's weakness. Gi asks if he has any evidence, but Seol denies it. The Mantis does not leave evidence behind after all. Gi asks if it's an assumption then, but Seol notes that even if it's an assumption on his part, this may prove useful for him. If he narrows it down to a single person, does he not have enough power to forge evidence on that assumption? Seol is betting it all now on the simple fact that Gi 
and those besides him can easily reveal the truth of this assumption. Gi smiles and agrees, asking for his name again. Seol tells him, so Gi crouches down and notes that he has to confirm his loyalty first. He must do something for him. He will have to kill an enemy, the one that's close to the mantis, Myung. Gi asks if he will do it, but Seol doesn't understand why he has to do it. Gi tells him that this is verification to prove he is trustworthy, since he might just be on the mantis's side and stab him in the back. Can he do it though? Seol knows that he cannot deny his request. This is something that he must do. He vows, on his name as the flying assassin squad leader, that his will be done. The enemy shall be killed in his name. Much later, as dawn rises above the demonic academy, Seol dresses up, and with a sword on his belt, he is ready to complete the objective given to him. He remembers what Gi told him, that he will be waiting at the top of the library for the news, on the twelfth floor. All he must do is kill Myung, and then report back as swiftly as possible. Seol thinks that Gi probably doesn't think he can complete this objective, but perhaps he looks at everyone like that, considering he's a heavenly demon disciple, but he is on a whole different level. He opens his status window, revealing all of the skills and stats he has. He compares them with Myung, who has much more health and stamina than him, while also possessing more attack skills. Seol, however, has one advantage, the only way for him to complete this mission, the white fluorescent demonic arts. As Seol walks to his target, he ponders a very deep question. When does one relax? When one eats or sleeps? It's neither of those. It's when someone takes a shit. He contemplated this decision endlessly, as when he was bored, he beat him up, or when he felt awful, any excuse he had he used on him. He vowed long ago to see his head fall off right in front of him. That's why he studied him a lot, and found out he takes a while to shit. He will hide where he drops his guard the most. He will crawl into the toilet itself and strike. Even though it's extremely disgusting, he has no other choice. He will tolerate it, as it's the only way for him to survive. In the end, because of his actions, he will reign supreme. Suddenly, he hears something, and sure enough it's Myung, as this bastard has a schedule for things like this. Fortunately, this time he seems to be carrying a heavy load too. Seol jumps into the toilet and much to his surprise, it's clean, meaning that it must have been cleaned recently. Myung continues his approach and takes his pants down, making Seol also get into position, as he only has to strike just once. When Myung crouches down, Seol begins to attack his exposed behind, but suddenly, Myung drops his dung, forcing Seol to use the white fluorescent movement art to dodge, and then go in once again. Somehow, Seol equipped the great ship sword with those movements, meaning that he will deal much more damage than usual. Seol is surprised about this, but what's more surprising is that his body begins moving on its own and unleashes a strike so mighty that it cuts the toilet in half. After the attack, Myung's health is depleted and he dies on the spot. Seol looks at the sword's energy, which seems unruly, yet quite powerful. With his objective successful, Seol goes to a nearby river to wash his face and any secretions that might have stuck to him. Now he holds three coins, meaning that he has three chances now. He begins laughing. He sure surprised himself with that attack, and he opens his status window once again and looks at the great ship sword ability, wondering how he even used it. He also notices that his stamina didn't deplete at all when using the skill. If he can really use that power with no restrictions, he can become much stronger. As a reminder of his faults, his right arm begins to convulse and hurt. He did lose an arm in this life, and if word got out that he was the one who killed Myung, he would be in much greater danger than before, since it will become difficult for him to get stronger in this life. With his disabled self, he will live this life for the sake of the next one. Perhaps he should reveal everything he can to Gi, but he isn't that trustworthy yet, so he should think about it carefully. He can't quite grasp Gi's reasoning, but he has thought about it long enough. It's time for him to make his report, but not to the person he is supposed to. Seol goes to the mantis and bows down to him. He asks if he's gone utterly insane. How dare he set foot in his study and reek while he does so. Seol explains that he had no other option besides this. How else could he have gotten rid of Myung with his own hands? They both know he would lose if he fought fairly. The mantis looks at him and notes that he is indeed curious about how a worm like him did it. But before that, there's something more important. Seol can feel the mantis's energy overwhelm him. It's getting hard to breathe. His lungs are closing and he's becoming hot. The mantis grabs his hair and asks who he met. Seol tries to ask why that even matters, but the mantis grabs his hair tighter and explains that he's asking the questions here. If he dares to mutter something careless again, he will kill him in an instant. Seol notes that, rather than who he met, isn't it more important that he's hiding something crucial from him? The mantis feels that this is a threat. Has he gone insane after he went to the library? How dare he forsake his gift? Seol screams at him. He should be more truthful with his actions and words. Is he not the one who constantly wishes him dead? Additionally, since he seems to be dying of curiosity, the earth demon, Gi, has sent him. Naturally, that is a lie, but it does not matter if he gets found out now. 
Since there is something more important at play here, he must do anything to find out. The Mantis lets go of his hair. If he is helping that man, then he can understand why he killed Myung the way he did. He will spare him for now. So what does he wish to know? Seol explains that he asked when and when he secretly talked with the Hua sect elder Zhang. Seol wonders how he will respond. If a person from the Demonic Academy interacts with another faction, it's considered an act of treason, no matter their status or position. The Mantis asks if Gi really asked that, which Seol confirms. The Mantis asks if there's anything more that he asked, and Seol tells him that he wondered when they will next meet. To drive the point home, Seol says that Gi has been wondering about this issue for a very long time, so he should be as honest as possible. Seeing no other way out of this, the Mantis tells him. They agreed to meet at Yellow Mountain at the beginning of the next month. Seol is shocked that he actually took the bait, but also notices a system notification on the ground. When he takes a closer look, he sees that the system has given him the secret map of the Supreme Court Lord, which he instantly accepts. Within it, a route to Yellow Mountain is recorded, as is the location of Zhang. Seol is surprised that it holds so much useful information, but it doesn't stop there, as a toolbox is created for him, giving him one medicinal herb and one nutritional bar, besides the secret map which is also there. Seol wonders what these things are, but he doesn't have time to do that for long, as the Mantis asks when Gi taught him demonic arts so powerful. Seol notes that it was just a couple of days ago, and it's nothing special anyway. The Mantis asks when they first met, and Seol explains that he first met him when he arrived at the Xi'an Il Library. The Mantis finds this quite strange, from his point of view at least. It has not been long since he sent him here, but he actually trusted him, taught him important demonic arts, and ordered him to kill Myung in the span of only a few days. What's more, is that he ordered him to gather information like this, right? Seol confirms as such, which proves to be fatal, as the Mantis drives his hand in his chest. He knows that he was taking him for a fool all of this time, which is the last mistake his enemies make. As Seol's blood drops down from the Mantis's hand, he wonders why he was even born, and why he's here. Why is he not affected when he takes the life of another? Why must he get stronger still? All of the questions in his mind started with why, but it came down to one single question. Why does he have to stand behind the strong? That is also probably why he angered the Mantis so much. Since he's about to die, he will bless him with the reason as to why he knew he was a liar. Gi does not teach martial arts to anyone. He only uses the martial arts that were handed on to him by the headmaster. Seol laughs, which surprises the Mantis. He probably doesn't know since he is such a fool, and a senile fool at that, but he has already lost to him. This enrages the Mantis enough to end his life right there and then, in a gruesome sight of blood and anger. Seol restarts back from the very beginning, slowly getting up in his morning days once again. He notices that his hand is fine too, which he's very grateful for, but now he only has two lives left, which means he has to be much more careful. He opens his status window and sees that his stats have increased a bit, presumably because his arm is fine, but who knows. He also seems to have lost the white fluorescent demonic arts, although he remembers them pretty clearly. As he does so, the system notifies him that he obtained them, meaning that remembering them counts, which is pretty good for him. He also opens the tools tab, it being brand new to him. He wonders how to use the map while it's in there, but the system immediately asks if he would like to summon it. When he accepts, the map appears in his hand through sheer magic, which is quite convenient for him. Since he has it now, he decides to take a look and sees the yellow mountain on it, the place that the mantis mentioned previously. Since the tab is still open, he opens the medicinal herb item, which increases his health by two, and the nutritional bar, which increases his health by three. When he summons the nutritional bar, he is surprised to find it has a pleasant smell, and when he takes a bite of it, he is mesmerized by the taste, and he also gains three health for it too, although he has to consume it all. He thinks that it would be better to save this for a more dire situation, and just as he thinks that he would like to store it, the system asks if he would like to store it. Just by thinking about it, the item goes back into the toolbox, confirming that now he has a very useful place to store things in. With that out of the way, he must get moving, as he has some important things to do. He swiftly rushes to the Chiano Library and climbs to the 12th floor, where Gi is, and he requests his presence. Seol waits patiently for an answer, before Gi asks who he is. Seol introduces himself as the squad leader of the Flying Assassin Squad, a low-rank squad from the Supreme Court. G asks why he has come so far, looking for someone like him. Seol explains that he has information that he may find useful for his dream of becoming a good leader. After a bit of breathtaking silence, G invites him inside. Seol opens the doors slowly and finds G standing at a table, noting that he's quite amusing for a low-ranking member. He has decided to bless him with a chance. So what is the information that will be useful for his dream of becoming a good leader? Seol takes a deep breath to prepare himself, and hands him the map, which Gi inquires about. Seol encourages him to read it, 
and Guy decides to do so, finding the contents quite shocking. His demeanor and tone change as he asks if this is true information, which Seol swears on his very life. Guy doesn't care for that. What's his life worth to someone like him anyway? Seol notes that he's just a lowly squad leader who wishes to stand behind him. Guy can see the determination in his eyes and asks why he would wish to do that. After a bit of pondering, Seol says that he too wishes to become stronger, like everyone else around here. Guy can respect that answer and slowly approaches him. If the information he has here is correct, he can promise anything he wants. Guy goes to confirm the information, but Seol can no longer wait. As he has left for three entire hours, the anticipation is getting to him, and he can't shake off the feeling of dread he has. The authorities within the Demon Academy, like the court or the society, how would Gi be aware of the political relationships between them? He too knows that the Lord of the Supreme Court does not stand behind the Earth Demon, but rather the First Disciple, the Blood Demon. Finally, Gi arrives back and asks if his name was Seol, which he confirms, while wondering what will happen if he fails. What will he do in his next life? Suddenly the system asks if he would like to save his progress, and which file to use, confusing him. But Seol is quick to adapt, and sees this as an opportunity. He decides to use the first save file, just as Gi asks him to choose between three options. The first one is to become his core warrior, the second is to become his aide, and the third, which is the most difficult, is to become his secret swordsman. Time stops once again, giving Seol enough time to look things over. He can see for himself that each choice will lead him to a completely different life, and that the symbols appearing below are the difficulty levels of said life. Seol takes a closer look at the first choice, the military, being the Academy's principal education center, is supervised by the Corps. It's basically a talent cultivation center, where supervisors train people, only intending to let out three to four people per year, out of 100. While he can increase his internal energy and martial arts skills, the training does not guarantee that he will survive. The second option is much safer, as he only has to learn from Elder Quan, who is ranked 94th within the Academy. The only difficult thing about this task would have to be enduring his rather unique personality, and worst case, he would end up crippled again. Additionally, he might also get a shot at the Mantis with him, but that has too many variables, such as having enough political power to do such a thing and actually do it. The third option is the most dangerous, as he has to kill someone of great importance, but just who is that person? If the difficulty is so high, he's certain that it's no easy opponent. So with all of the decisions in his mind, he decides to go with the easiest one and become his warrior. Gi agrees to it, and Seol thinks that above all, he must put his survival as a priority, and whatever situation he's in, if he can obtain another life, he can change the situation. Gi explains that there are only six days left to get admitted to the academy, so he will personally talk with the secretary of this place to get him in. All he needs to do is stand by in the basement. Seol thanks him for showing such care for him, but Gi says that it's nothing. He deserves as much. Additionally, while he's there, he should look for a book called The Textbook on the Three Primary Excellences, as it should provide a jumpstart to his martial arts. Seol knew that this guy didn't just like that book or something, he really knew what was in it. Gi tells him to prepare the best he can in these six days, which Seol agrees to, this time with a smile on his face, as he has finally secured a future for himself. Later, Seol runs to the basement like a kid, as he might finally be able to master the three primary excellences. He didn't have a chance to master the other two, but now, with his body in tip-top shape, he is ready. He starts scouring for it in the endless pile of books in the library, but eventually finds it and the system shows that the other two are now unlocked. The fiery fist demonic arts mastered by the former vice principal, and the mantises convening final demonic arts. With these, he will be much more powerful. First, he chooses to master the fiery fist demonic arts, but there's no pop-ups. Perhaps this demonic art only requires the hands. The demonstration starts playing in front of him, which he is excited to see, but he is left in awe as the figure activates the demonic arts and shows power that could take out half of this library with ease. Seol is left with his mouth open, and notes that this demonic art really is a destructive force to be reckoned with. But next, is the convening final demonic arts. This is the demonic art that the Mantis uses, and is prominent within the Academy. It is a power that he could never imagine wielding in his previous life. The demonstration continues, showing the precision and destructiveness of the attack, which makes Seol quite happy as he can't believe he has the opportunity to master all of these techniques. Since he has six days to do it too, he will make sure that he will train with everything he's got. It takes a while for Seol to get them down, but in the end, he is able to imitate all of them. Even though he did that, he cannot fully manifest the same amount of power as in the demonstration, probably because he lacks the internal energy to even do so. Once he has enough of that, he will be able to properly use them. But until then, he has to continue training. On the admission day for the military, 
Seol gets prepped up and ready, but suddenly, a strange man arrives and asks if he is Seol. He is Jio Woon. Gi has asked him to personally escort him to the military. Before Seol can respectfully bow, Woon hands him an internal energy amplifying medicine, the immortal pill, or an elixir, most commonly called. With this one pill, he can increase his internal energy by up to 10 years worth. Seol graciously accepts it and thinks that just one elixir can give one endurance worth 60 years. So his internal energy, which is about only three years worth, is about to become a whole lot stronger. Seol asks if it's really all right for him to take it, but Woon insists it will be important for him to survive the military. With that, Seol takes it, and besides his health having a bit of a boost, he gains tons of internal energy, something he is very happy to see. He didn't expect to ever have such luck, but that's not all, as he has now learned the mind reading skill, which strengthens visions and understanding of the status of a Murum person. Seol thinks that this is because his stamina went up, but considering the new special conditions, it seems he has obtained a pretty powerful skill. Because of his new skill, he can now view others' status windows, which does not say much, but at least it's something for now. That's when he notices something even worse, something that makes his blood run thick in his veins. The escort that was sent to escort him is showing hostility towards him, as he's a double agent. Seol has no choice but to follow him, but all the while he wonders when this spy even popped up. If this is factual information, the person who sent the spy can guarantee an advantage over Gi. Suddenly Woon stops and shows Seol that they have arrived. Now he must go alone, as he is done escorting him. Before he leaves, Seol knows that something's about to happen, and sure enough, he is presented with three options, all seeming to entice Woon into battle, but one of them is new, as it's an expression, something that has not appeared before. Since he has to make a choice now, he asks if there's nothing he wishes to tell him, which confuses Woon at first, but he repeats the question soon after, making Woon's eyes become cold. He asks Seol what he means, but he says that he's just a little confused. Woon asks what could confuse him, so Seol explains that the military is where the skilled and distinguished come to train. Gi should know that he's also skilled too. When he gave him that pill, it was to prove how difficult it would be for him to survive these awful plays. Woon asks what this has to do with anything, but Seol is only wondering if it's okay for him to go in such a weakened state. Will he be able to survive only by increasing his internal energy? Woon stares at him for a bit and walks forwards while pondering what to do. His words ring true. It will not be easy for him, so he will do him one last service and hand him this. What Seol got is a short sword, which has the special effect of making the user feel good, for some odd reason. Woon also goes on to explain that the military is a place where only those chosen by the core branch heads can come, so he will master skills from missions and the books that are held there. Ji is pretty considerate for choosing someone like him for such a task, so he must not forget to properly thank him when he gets the chance. Seol agrees and goes to the entrance of the military, where a large open gate stands. With a heavy breath, he goes in, but not before considering what to do with the sword. He's glad that he at least got something, but he should probably hide it, as getting caught with something so nice will only create trouble for him in the future. He puts it in his tool tab, and with that, he steals himself before entering the building. Once he does so, he is met with the instructor, an old yet stern figure. He is the one who oversees every test conducted within the military, and he's just one level underneath the mantis. Even if he has the role of a teacher, he should not be underestimated. As in this academy, anyone can be a deadlier force than imagined. He asks Sale if he's here to join, which he confirms. So he spreads four bamboo plaques on the table in front of him and asks Seol to choose. The choices are Shin, Eon, Seo, and Pan. Seol figures from the characters alone that they mean corpus, eloquence, writing, and judgment specifically. This is probably how he will determine which tests he will take. So there's some thinking that needs to be done. The Shin plaque has to do with the body, and the Eon one probably has to do with speaking. Does the CO one have writing integrated in it? And as for Pan, how can he train for judgment? The instructor sees the indecision in his expression and says that he will have to do them all anyway. With this information, Seol feels that it's not worth it to overthink it, so he chooses Shin, which the instructor throws at him, and explains that he will have to collect six other bamboo plaques just like this one. He has one day for this task. He will pass if he arrives at this hour tomorrow. The door behind him is the door he needs to go through, which he may also use to come back should he choose to do so. There are many things waiting for him within, from classified books to treasures and even artillery. He will be able to pick up anything he wishes from there, so he should be swift and move in. Seol does as he is told, and before he fully disappears, the instructor looks at him one last time. As Seol runs in, he thinks that there will be other people who have received the same conditions, so he must obtain six plaques from them. This basically means that they will have to fight for them, most likely until death. When he gets out of the dark corridor, 
he is met with a lush landscape that strikes him with awe. He is also amazed by the grand buildings littering this place. If he roams a lot around here, he is bound to obtain incredible items. Unfortunately, it also increases the chance of him being caught by the other trainees. So if he wants to obtain the items he needs, he must go about as much as possible. He must become stronger and survive in this place, no matter what. After thinking to himself for a bit, he notices how quiet this place is. Perhaps he came too soon, or perhaps the others are hiding their presence too well. For now though, he should go into that building and see what he can do. He should move as fast as possible, so that there's no chance for him to get caught. He suddenly bolts through the tall grass, barely able to stop himself at the building's wall and hug it with his back. After looking around, he lets out a deep sigh, but what he sees next almost makes his heart stop. The system warns him that an enemy has found his weak point, and asks how he will proceed. He has three choices, attack, defend, or simply flee. Seol is extremely confused. How did someone find his weak point? Since this is the first time this happens to him, and he only has a few seconds to choose, he decides to flee, and almost immediately, he jumps high into the air. Seol did this unwillingly, his body just decided to do it. It seems like what he did was not enough, as a giant flash of light appears from behind him and something slashes his back, making him fall to the ground and bleed heavily. His attacker also lands down and notes that he missed. He wanted to kill him before he even knew who did it. The attacker's stats average, but under the circumstances he's at an advantage, as Seol's health and internal energy have both plummeted to half, allowing him only a few choices. Seol is surprisingly calm about all of this, and thinks that he was lucky to avoid a fatal wound, but this one isn't doing him many favors either. The attacker wishes to not waste any time, and Seol is of the same mind. There is no reason to. Since he cannot know how strong his opponent is, he decides to use what he can see, that his internal energy is much lower than his, meaning that this guy is nothing to fear, and only a small stepstone for him. The attacker becomes him forward, so Seol confidently charges in, which surprises the attacker, who has but a few seconds to block. The white in the white fluorescent arts stands for frigidity, which is the lack of any emotion in his attacks. It's also the reason why a white mist appears around his mouth as he breathes slower. Besides this, it also makes his opponent move stagnantly, allowing him to move in with ease, and end this fight by cutting his head clean off. With this power, he cannot miss any opportunity. Even if he's still at a level where he can only imitate this art, it is still improving his combat skills by a large margin, to the point where he cannot recognize himself anymore. He looks at his status window to see how far his health and internal energy have fallen, and while it's not bad to be able to see something like this, it's also a warning that death is one mistake away. He starts looting his attacker, and sure enough, he finds one of the plaques he required, but also something new, a golden potion. He knows that this is something used to heal injuries, meaning that the gods really must be on his side today. With no other choice, Sale goes into the building and stops his bleeding with a few rags. He did this so that his health would stop decreasing so much, but he's become fearful. If things continue like this, he will die soon enough. He would like to use the golden potion, but in situations like this one, he should use it in an emergency. If he winds up meeting someone much stronger than he is, the golden potion would have been used for nothing. He has unfinished business in this realm. He will have the heads of those two no matter what. He checks to see what tools he can use, and sees that he still has the medicinal herbs, which upon use, increase his HP by two, and stop his bleeding completely. Seal doesn't have time to be happy about this for long, as he feels a rumbling in the building, coming from somewhere close. When he goes to check, he finds someone who has just ended a battle, and identifies him as Chiuk Ho. There are seven squads under the Supreme Court Lord, Tu, Il, Wul, Hua, Su, Mok, and Jium. Squads that are officialized will also have Huk, which means black, added to the front of their names. He knows that Chiuk Ho is the head of the Black Fire Squad, and since he was harassed by Juk Myung constantly, this guy must mean trouble. He probably is a better fighter than he is, so if he wants to end him now, he will have to do it in a single blow. While thinking about this, he wonders if he can use the window that appeared when he killed Myung, but he does not know how to trigger it. What's fortunate is that Chiok has his guard down now, but the window still isn't popping up. Does he have to find the opportunity himself? Since this guy will probably not linger here for longer, he cannot wait, so no matter how injured he is, he must go in now. That's when the system pop-up he wanted appears, and asks what he would like to do, attack, use martial arts, or perhaps a tool. Seol is glad that he got it, but these options are new for him, so he wonders what will be wisest here. With only three seconds left, Seol decides to attack him, as it's safe and bound to work. He also notices that he will be sent back in time three seconds ago, which does indeed happen. Seol is pleasantly surprised by this, and charges in so swiftly that Chiak is still smiling as a sharp blade penetrates his body. He has died in one hit, which Seol can't believe he did. Things really worked out in the end. 
With this out of the way, he loots his body and finds five plaques, and besides those, a bunch of items. So much so that the tools tab changes in order to accommodate both medicine and equipment tabs. The reason Seol put everything in tools is because the moment he pulls something out, like the golden potion he just used, the effects get immediately applied, so it's rather quick. With his new healthy body, he checks out the heavenly silver breastplate he received, and wonders if he can equip it from here too. Sure enough, he can, but not only that, the breastplate becomes invisible, and he can't even feel the weight of it. This whole thing is a blessing for someone like him. Unfortunately, he has fallen into the trap of the one before him, and has celebrated for too long, allowing an enemy to sneak up on him, making the system ask what he would like to do again. Seol can't believe that he really let down his guard so much, but now what does he do? Does he face this unknown opponent, or flee? That could get him injured once again, but that's when he notices that if he defends, he will get the location of the enemy. He decides to do that, and as time resumes, he feels his opponent behind him. But even with this, he only has time to turn around before being struck in the chest so hard that he is sent flying. Seol manages to land on his feet, but he was almost killed by this attack. He wouldn't have been able to stop this attack no matter what, and if he had selected to flee, he would have gotten himself killed. No matter what he did here, he would have still suffered damage. It's only thanks to this breastplate that he is alive. The enemy notes that he took him as a simpleton, yet his sword did not go through his exposed back. He is probably using equipment, isn't he? Using the system, Seol can see that this guy is named Oma, the squad leader of the Heavenly Abyss, and has pretty good stats. This is someone stronger than those he has fought previously. As the opponent stares him down, Seol thinks that if anything, the worst part about this is that this guy's internal energy and health are superior, and not even Myung and Chiak combined would be this much trouble as this guy is. What's the most shocking, however, is the fact that this guy is only worth a single life. How can somebody of such power be worth so little? Oma asks why he's rolling over his eyes like that. He's going to die no matter what, so he better accept it now. After a bit of silence, Seol says that he worked hard in this life, more than anyone, and thinks that this is just unfair. Oma wonders if he's gone insane from the idea of dying, but Seol continues talking to himself, as everything he does feels like crap. He died and lived again and again, doing his absolute best throughout to survive. Life was finally starting to look up for him. He thought that he had a chance among the disparities of this academy. But once again, it has proved to him that it's unfair. Oma now really believes that he's gone crazy, something he didn't expect to see in this place. As Seol unsheathes his blade, he says that he has indeed gone crazy. If he is fated to die, he will struggle until his very soul is snuffed out. With that, he charges in swiftly with the white fluorescent arts, not impressing Oma at all. He simply blocks the attack, making Seol push the blade hard, allowing something to happen that never has before. The contact point of the blade starts to grow, and suddenly they blow up in a blue dust cloud, forcing Oma to retreat, yet Seol stands the same. He is doing this mostly because he is confused at what just happened, and even more so as he's seeing that Oma has been injured. He knows that his sword didn't go through, it just clashed with his, but if he can really apply damage this way, surviving might still be worth a try. It is known that there is also another fluorescent art called the Freezing Fluorescent Arts, and it utilizes the cold, making it the ultimate demonic art that only the highest ranked squadrons could hope to unleash. It's something more suitable for women, as men tend to utilize extreme chi. However, because of its amazing capabilities, men wanted to learn it. So throughout history, they created other martial arts that were derived from this one. Seol thought that the white fluorescent demonic arts might be one of those, as he does not possess a polarized body, nor meridians that allow the chi to easily flow. Yet he is able to unleash this demonic art with ease. This is probably the case, as it's far too powerful for something simple. Oma is starting to get annoyed at Seol's perseverance, who sees that his internal energy is also dropping pretty heavily with each attack, meaning that if he's to win this, he must do it swiftly and precisely. Oma suddenly charges in, but due to his wide stance, Seol is able to dodge each attack. Even if it's difficult to maintain this speed, he can see his attacks, which allows him to clash swords once again. Oma unfortunately gains the upper hand by throwing their swords to the left, allowing him to kick Seol so hard that he must retreat, as he suffered too much damage once again. Oma congratulates him for lasting so long with his petty little tricks, but this is his end. Seol believes his words, and prepares for the worst, but that's when his proficiency in the white fluorescent demonic arts increases from imitating to beginner level, something he really didn't expect to see. Since this is an upgrade to his martial arts, it won't give him his health back, but it provides an opportunity for him to try once again. He jumps and slashes at Oma, who cannot match his speed and backs away, but not without injury. Seol is surprised by how fast he is, and thinks that if he can maintain this speed, he truly has a chance. He flies towards Oma with the most powerful drive known to man, 
the will to live, and clashes swords with him once again. Oma notices something, and asks what the hell he just did, making Seol also see that he cracked his sword in the middle, rendering it completely useless. The system also detects this as the perfect opportunity to strike Oma's weak point, and asks Seol what he would like to do. He thinks that this time, he probably can't take this guy down with just attacking, so he chooses to use martial art. Unfortunately, two of them are locked, and only the fiery fist demonic arts remain. Seol figures that this is because he doesn't have enough internal energy to use the other two, so with no other choice, he resumes time and smashes his palm into Oma's chest, before activating the flaming vermilion palm. The fiery attack scorches Oma's skin and insides, killing him in an instant. After he falls to the ground, Seol gets on his knees, as his health and internal energy are almost gone too. He knows how dangerous this guy truly was. If he hadn't gotten the weak point window, he might not have been able to defeat him. He will not repeat the same mistake and linger for longer. He will literally die if he does so. He swiftly loots Oma, gaining a bunch of elixirs and a classified book. After a much needed rest, the sun comes up, and Seol wakes up too. He recovered using another golden potion, and hid here until now. He has acquired the six bamboo plaques needed for the test, and also wanted to put away the items from Oma into the toolbox to save them for the next life. But the toolbox for some reason rejected them, almost like it was trying to exclude items that could help him have an easier next life. The two elixirs he got, one which slightly increases maximum health, and the other one internal energy, are quite useful. At first, Seol wondered what to do with them, but he decided to be careful about what he does. If he were to use them and end up dying once again, he would basically lose them, so perhaps he can trade them for something else that can give him an ongoing effect. He also has this classified book, which is a martial art of stealth, and since martial arts do not disappear from his mind, he decides to learn it. As soon as he does so, everything about the technique is engraved into his mind, like he always knew them. If he uses this stealth technique and the weak point window as a combo, he will be at a great advantage. He decides it's time to get up and walk towards the exit. As he thought about it, things became clearer and clearer. He should take all of this luck that was given to him, and leave nothing behind for the vultures. If he could use it with no limit, then his dream of climbing to a comfortable stop is no longer a dream. As he approaches the door, a bright light shines in front of him, glimmering of hope, and most importantly, luck. When Seol touches it, the system asks if he would like to save, but after looking at his older save, he decides not to. He has no regrets here. He does not know if this opportunity will present itself again, or if this is the last time something like this will appear, but it's better if he does not save here. There are tons of treasures in this place, and when he comes back here in his next life, he will make sure to loot it all. Aseol drops the plaques in front of the instructor, who glares at him so intently that he asks if something's wrong. Even if there is, the instructor only tells him to choose his next task. Since he knows that he will have to do them all, Seol picks the second one in order, Eon. So the instructor tells him to go to the door on his right. As Seol walks past, he can't help but think that nobody is here, and even if this is not the only entrance to this place, he thought that he would at least meet a couple of people. Alas, there is nobody here. He climbs down to the next trial, and thinks that he doesn't care as long as he can go through it. The next test awaits him, so he shouldn't linger any longer. As soon as he opens the door, however, he hears someone cursing, and when he looks in the room, which is quite small, he only sees a man, who lets out a deadly killer instinct. Seol's eyes widen and sweat starts to fall as he feels it. Just from this, he can deduce that this man is extremely powerful. But more importantly, the thing above his head doesn't indicate that it will give him a life, but something else. The man curses at him, and asks what he wants, with Seol bowing and saying that he's here for the military exam. The room falls silent, with the man seemingly not even wanting to answer. So Seol tries to repeat the question, but the man warns him. If he doesn't stop repeating the same fucking thing, he will make sure to cut his head off. Seol once again feels that overwhelming bloodlust, and also begins shaking while wondering what he has to do for this test. However, he quickly regains composure, as he will be disqualified if he cannot complete this test. From what he's seeing, there's nothing in this room, except something on the way back, a bowl with a piece of paper on it. He decides to walk forward, with the man not really caring for his actions. Seol picks up the piece of paper, and he is met with a question. He is on a covert mission, and has received orders to kill some middlemen. While he is walking through the deep forest, he finds an empty house, there he also finds the men he was searching for. They are getting ready to leave, and they all know martial arts, with one of them being stronger than him, one of them being just the same, and one weaker. How will he resolve this situation? He gets a bunch of answers to choose from, wondering what the purpose of the fourth one is, but a surprise attack is also reckless. Making conversation doesn't seem like a good idea, so he chooses to wait by the house until something happens. Seol says that this is the best way out loud, making the man smile. 
He notes that he can't feel bad now, since he warned him, and before Seol can fully turn around, his head is cut clean off. As he dies, Seol can only feel one emotion, anger. He returns back to his save point, where he has to choose what to do for Gi. The annoyance he just experienced still lingers in his mind, but he must move forward and not dwell on it. He once again chooses to become Gi's core warrior, and the conversation goes on as the last time. He remembers it all clearly, because he already lived it once. After Gi leaves, Seol remembers how he couldn't even turn around fully before being killed. He is still too damn weak, to the point where it's annoying. If he wants to live, he has to be prepared for anything. The toolbox items he stored are still there, meaning that if he were to steal something from this room and put it in the toolbox, he will be able to use it in his next life. Since he has nothing left to lose except his life, he begins searching around the room for anything useful and comes up to a mirror, which shows that he only has one life left. He decides not to dwell on it as it will sadden him, so he begins searching more earnestly, which provides something pretty good. In Ji's dressing cabinet, he finds a hidden compartment behind the clothes, and in it, he finds the Wind Final Demonic Art, which is an ultimate classified book. Seol breathes heavily as he reads it, as this is something truly amazing. He rushes to the basement of the library until he runs out of breath, but even this couldn't contain his excitement. He screams out as he looks at it one more time, and hopes that this is not a dream, and that he really found one of the four final demonic arts. After falling down and continuing to smile, reality hits him, and he rises up. His stats are trash. Perhaps he should really ask Woon for the dragon pill next time. He thought that playing it safely and carefully would spare him from any unnecessary case, but his past life proved otherwise. Only fate influences who has treasures within the military, so if he wants to prepare for fighting the masters, he must be stronger. Since he was able to store the two elixirs he got, he decides to use them now, granting him health and internal energy, much more than expected. After they take full effect, he can not only feel that his stats have changed, but his physical appearance has changed too, as his muscles have grown quite a bit. Perhaps even his height increased. But what's more important now is to try this ultimate power, which is able to unleash hell on any enemy. He prepares to use it in earnest, but the ability is locked, which confuses him. The reason why this ability is locked is because he requires a minimum of 30,000 health and 50,000 internal energy to use it, meaning he still has a long way to go before it becomes useful in any way. Although since he is in this position, he should be able to achieve it relatively quickly. Since he has time, he decides to learn how to properly use the Great Ship Sword ability, as it does not consume internal energy, and it's a useful skill. He pulls out his blade and steals himself for the journey ahead. On the day of the military exam, he is met with the same scene as in his past life, where Woon gives him the immortal pill, which combined with the other pills, increases his stats by quite a bit, and increases the proficiency of the fiery fist demon art to beginner. As Seol thanks him, he thinks that with this much internal energy, the military exam shouldn't be as hard as last time. Woon once again points him to the building when they arrive and tries to leave, just in time for Seol to receive the system window asking what he would like to do. He can see that the second option has fully disappeared, probably because he already has the short sword with him, so he decides to ask for the flying dragon pill. Woon asks him to repeat himself, so Seol starts to spin a story. Gi had told him that he would give him an immortal and flying dragon pill. He was asking just in case he had it. Woon looks at Seol sternly, making him apologize for what he said. He probably didn't receive it anyway. Woon swiftly hands him the pill, which surprised Seol, but he knew all of this time that he had it. He thanks him for giving it to him, but Woon suddenly calls him over and punches him straight in the gut, making Seol fall down. Woon starts to give him a few good kicks in the head to drive the point in, and finally he crouches down to his level. Someone as worthless as him will die in this place, but if he lives, he will see to it that it still happens. Before leaving he spits on his face, making him laugh at this worthless sight. Seol isn't that affected and takes the dragon pill, while thinking that if he lives through this day, he will surely be his next target. His stats increase by a pretty large margin, making two of his skills normal level and one beginner level, while also increasing his mind reading passive skill. With that he can see Woon's stats, and also his growing hostility towards him. Seol goes to the instructor once again, and chooses the first one, with the instructor also giving him the same instructions, to collect six, and return by this hour tomorrow. Instead of going silent, Seol asks a question. He's not the only one here, right? Based on the number of bamboo plaques, there are probably other people. But why is there nobody around here? The instructor doesn't respond, making Seol wonder if he did something bad, as normally nobody would dare to speak with this guy. He decides that the silence is his answer, and walks away. But the instructor suddenly says that a person's eyes are destined to get higher and higher. From this, Seol can understand that there are definitely others here. The fact that he cannot see them means that they either came at a different time, or through a different area. 
The people here do not waste time on these kinds of questions. They are all fighting to get stronger. The phrase that the instructor just said might also mean that stronger people will get here eventually, but that changes nothing. If he must fight them anyway, he better get a move on and take advantage of the treasures within this place. He doesn't take the time to appreciate the scenery like in the past, as soon as this place will become a blood fest, where everything goes. First things first, he decides to go to the building he was ambushed by, as this time he will be the one making the attack. He analyzes the building for a bit, but he can't spot anything suspicious, and the longer he waits, the higher the chance of an enemy attack. He decides to lure out the attacker by just walking by, seeming like he has his guard down completely. Seol gets the message that he's about to get ambushed, which is all he's been waiting for. Last time he decided to flee, which wound up being stupid, as he got hurt in the process. This time he won't hesitate, as now he knows that his opponent is nothing special, and he can bring him down with ease. He decides to face him, and sees the ugly mug of the attacker way above him. The attacker instantly jumps into action, but this time Seol smiles, as he easily knocks him away. Truly, he's not a big deal after all. He knows that there is a huge gap between their skills, which is even more evident now because of the opponent's expression. Seol immediately finds his weak point and readies his blade, looking more gleeful to take a life than ever. What excites Seol the most is not the kill, it's the gap between them. He cannot believe that such a thing could excite him, but here he is, having a blast. In this life, he could win against this bastard no matter what he chooses. So since he has already used attack and martial arts, he should see what the last option offers, that being to use an item. He is presented with the tools tab, but it only has a few choices, and the classified book he has disappeared. He decides to equip the short sword, which prompts the system to ask where he would like it equipped. He chooses the right hand, which allows the scenario to resume and immediately pop the blade into his hands, something he thoroughly enjoys. Something like this will be useful if he breaks his sword or something, although it won't be an option if he has the option to strike the weak point. The ambusher tries his best, but he is far too slow for someone like Seol, and is dealt with swiftly. While jumping around, Seol wonders how many are in the military, and what of the treasures inside here, how many can there really be? He deduces that the bigger the building, the better loot it has, and using his new stealth ability, he is able to cover his tracks very well. Even if he is stronger than ever before, it's all relative. Nothing is guaranteed just yet, so he must exercise caution. He starts searching around once he gets inside, but he finds no treasures, although finding them so easily would have been a strange thing. That's when he hears some footsteps, and immediately hides, thinking that he wouldn't have been able to hear this in the past, but thanks to the stealth ability, he can. Since stealth also includes hearing quiet things, it's not strange that he can do this. The guy doesn't detect him and goes inside one of the rooms, allowing Seol to move in closer and see if he can find his weak point. He doesn't open the door, but can hear that he's moving, although where is impossible to know. One thing he knows is that if he stays here, someone will certainly attack, and avoiding that scenario is the best possible thing for now. He decides to go in, as his skills are plenty to deal with this guy. He hears Seol when he comes in, and a stat window pops up. This is Gu Yom, the squad leader of the extermination squad from the Holy Deity, and has average stats. Seol rushes in swiftly, making Yom defend himself, but even with the blades against them, he can feel the pressure Seol is giving off. He decides to back away, but in his foolishness, he trips, allowing Seol the perfect opportunity to strike, which almost kills Yom. Seol catches his breath for a bit, but notices that his guy is still alive, and is surprised that he didn't get a weak point pop up. Yom asks to be killed, making Seol realize that the pop-up doesn't work on those who have already lost any meaning in their lives. He has no reason to keep this man alive, but that's when he notices a medicinal bar in the cupboard he was searching, prompting him to ask why he was looking at this thing for so long. Unfortunately, Yom lost consciousness already, prompting Seol to just resort to ending him, but that's when the system asks if he would like to kill or torture him. This makes Seol stop, and Yom asks why he's not killing him, but now Seol wonders what to do. Well, in a situation like this, he should choose the new option and see what happens. He tells Yom that he knows the answer already and starts hurting him, just enough to not end his life. This is called Boon Goin Chak Gol. He's injecting him with energy to heighten his sensors and then twisting his bone to ensure that the most possible pain is being received. Seol would like an answer from him now, one that will satisfy him enough. Yom seems like he has no intent of answering, making Seol move in for another torture session, but Yom finally gives in, telling him that he has it. Seol asks what this is, and Yom tells him to lift his bandana, allowing Seol to get a fragment of a treasure map, one out of seven. He also sees that there are ten items in that treasure chest, meaning that getting it would be amazing. For a reward, Yom accepts to die peacefully, but when Seol goes in to fill his side of the bargain, the system asks if he would like to torture him more, which comes as a surprise. However, 
Now he's a little mad, as this bastard is still holding out on him, meaning that he will have to get a little more physical here. After a bit of wrestling, Seol manages to get all of the treasure map fragments, which was quite the venture, as Yom had them under his feet, his underwear, even places he would never like to visit again. He decides to give the map a look, but not before noticing the open drawer with the medicinal bar still inside. He crouches down and thinks that there should be a treasure in this drawer, but there isn't meaning that this guy was just confused when he sat idly by. Someone else must have taken the treasure, and even left this nutritional bar to taunt other people. Since this is a race for the treasure, he will have to move swiftly. The first treasure Seol gets is the manual for voice transmission, but since reading these things takes time, they will not be useful right now. However, since he can assimilate knowledge in a second, he is able to learn this ability with no difficulty, and prove that he's different. The second treasure is hidden behind some furniture, and is the manual for the production of demonic iron poison, which Seol doesn't need now, but it's not a bad idea to just have it. The next treasure he goes for is quite loud, as it's hidden in the ceiling, meaning that someone went through some effort to hide it. The third treasure are the high-class demonic combat arm guards, which Seol is confused about, as he doesn't know what high-class is. He decides to put them on, and he instantly learns the basic wind technique, and his proficiency with the vermilion palm also increases. When he reads the description closely, Seol finds that these were favorite items of Nok Jong Kwan, who is ranked 34th in the Demonic Academy. Seol knows the guy. He's an old man who now represents the guards. He plays a pretty significant role in the academy. Now he wonders if he was the one who placed them here, for the sake of the new students. If it's so, it means that the military alumni are treated quite well. With three treasures collected, Seol thinks he should hurry up, as he doesn't want to have any sort of competition when it comes to them. He bundles the map away and heads out, for the seven other treasures. As he walks down a set of stairs, he hears some commotion right in front of him, and decides to check it out. When he looks, he sees two different groups of two, bickering about something. The system immediately shows him the statuses of everyone, and through this, he is able to see their names. Mu Kyung, part of the Seven Dragon Team, tells his enemies to go and pick on someone their own size, but his teammate, Gam Ja, feels like they can take them on since they learned that synchronized attack. Seo Tae from the Demonic Dragon Team tells them that they are fools. The synchronized attacks from the base demon court are all clumsy. His teammate Sal Yu says that they will die if they do it wrong, and then they will just loot them. The base demon court and the red demon court are the two of the four pillars that support the core within the academy. The Lord of the Supreme Court and the Lord of the Holy Deity work in the red demon court, and they belong to the higher branches. Seoul thinks that this is why these guys are stronger than Juk Myung, who was the captain of the Black Moon Squad. All these powerful men are about to battle, but he has his eyes on another thing, the treasure that's across the room, right between these guys. Seol is at a standstill, as his stats are objectively better, but there are too many of them. Perhaps he should analyze the situation and see what abilities they have, but they probably won't show them if it's not a truly risky situation. As he wonders what to do, he suddenly sees that they started fighting, and observes the battle closely. In theory, it's better to plan out his actions rather than go in like a maniac, but he also doesn't want to leave and not get the treasure. He has seen death countless times before, and if he doesn't risk his own life, he knows that he won't achieve anything. When one of them falls to the ground, he finds his weak point, which he didn't want to do. He only thought about taking him out for a second. Besides the usual choices, another option also popped up, and since he has no time left, he must choose now. Using martial arts would probably get rid of one person, but there are still three left, and if he uses a lot of internal energy, they will all come for him. With only two seconds left, he decides to closely approach the opponent, which makes pillars of light appear around Ja, which Seol figures are where he can go. Since it has come to this, he won't do things wrong, he must think about it. Yu is the one positioned south of Ja, and to the west is his teammate, Kyung. This means that the east and the north are safe, as he will be distances from Yu and Tae, while also being behind Ja. With only these positions, he decides to formulate a plan. He will kill two people from each team, so that there will be more confusion for them, and less for him. With a heavy breath, Seol decides to do as he planned, and immediately teleports behind Ja, to the point where even he's surprised at the speed. Even if Ja reacts, it's too late for him to do anything, so Seol kills him with an instant attack, making the others fall into shock. After Ja's body falls to the ground, Seol thinks that with only this, he would have had an advantage, but it seems like the gods of luck are smiling on him today, as he has found the weak point of everyone, which is an incredible opportunity for him. With this, he is more confident than ever. He will win. His first victim is Yu, whom he uses martial arts on. When the system inquires what he would like to use, Seol uses two at the same time, the convening final demonic arts and the violent flaming eminence. Together, 
They create a mighty strike that goes through you like butter. He never had a chance of escaping. Seol is amazed by the amount of power he has just exerted, but also by the huge amount of internal energy that he has used. Although it's worth it for the shock factor alone, Tay suddenly charges him from behind, which catches Seol off guard, as he was focused on his abilities. Since it's too late to avoid the attack now, he decides to use the arm guards to his advantage, which gives him the opportunity to strike a defenseless Tay with full force, sending him flying out of the room and killing him. Seol catches his breath as a terrified Kyung looks at him, and notes that with his next kill, he will have enough bamboo plaques. Kyung knows that he cannot run so he charges in, making Seol smile. It doesn't take long for him to dispatch Kyung with only a few strikes, and finally be glad that it's over. He loots everyone, gaining quite a few items, from armor and blades to pills. With the bamboo plaques in his hand, he thinks that the chained crimson blade and the spear are useless to him, he will just throw them away. What interests him the most are the pills, one giving a little health boost while the other does the same, but with internal energy. He was expecting more from them, but they are still a boost, so it's better than nothing. The last thing he has to check out is the Eight Emperor's full body armor, which appears to be quite protective, but he will have to see just how good it is in his next battle. With everything out of the way, now he gets to the main event, the treasure he has fought so much for. When he opens the box, he is surprised to find yet another nutritional bar, meaning that someone got the treasure before he did. This happened twice now, but just who could it be? Seol doesn't have time to think for long as someone familiar sneaks up on him and readies their blade. Seol easily deflects the blade, forcing the mysterious attacker to back away and say that his luck is truly awful. He didn't want to fight strong guys. Seol is surprised to see Oma here, but with this in mind, he can guess why the treasures are empty and why there are nutritional bars there. If what he's thinking is true, what should have been here is the medicine that was supposed to be the pillar of development for him. The living skin vermilion muscle transfiguration pill and the blue pear drunken lotus pill. When he came to this place in his previous life, it was at a much later hour, and he knows that Oma couldn't have been able to kill the four guys who were fighting here. He would have been ganged up on quite easily. With authority, Seol says that he wants to ask something. Where will he go after this place? Is it not better for their paths to not intersect in the future? Oma doesn't want any beef with this guy, and says that he will be going to Yellow Roof, as there's probably some weaker guys there. Seol expected as such, as he met Oma at the Yellow Roof previously. He tells him that there's no reason to overextend himself like that. He will be the one to go to Yellow Roof, so he should go somewhere else, right? Oma immediately agrees and tries to leave, but Seol has one last question for him. Oma sweats as he wonders what he wishes to know, and Seol simply asks when the stronger guys will appear around here. He's asking because the people he has been fighting up until now have been boring. Oma thinks that he's joking at first, but he will tell him anyway, as he probably doesn't know a thing since he asked that. He admits that he's pretty unusual and strong, but that will be so only until tonight, as tomorrow, guys who are on an entirely different level will arrive, and if he doesn't gather many treasures before then, it will not be easy to survive the incoming onslaught. Seol ponders what he just heard for a bit before asking at what level those guys are. Oh Ma guesses that they are about chief commander level, that or a hall member who is representing the court. With that, he leaves, letting Seol think that the chief commanders who represent the courts are the core members of the demonic academy. They are all masters. And if those masters come to this place, he has to become stronger in order to survive. Seol decides that the best course of action is to get moving, and while he does that, he consumes the pills that he had. A little boost, but anything will help him now. As Seol takes down another opponent, he thinks that it's just as he suspected. Everything is the same as his previous life, and someone should come here soon. Sure enough, he gets the weak point notification, allowing him to seamlessly move behind the opponent and catch him by surprise. He should stop what he is doing, as he would have killed him already if that is what he really wanted to do. The man knows that his words ring true because of his sheer aura, and decides not to do anything in hopes that he will live. Seol looks down, and notices that the guy he took down was actually wearing the heavenly silver breastplate, which he did not expect to see so soon. However, this indicates to him that items he does not put into his tools tab appear again where they originally were. The man, named Chiak Ho, asks what he wants, and Seol gives him a glance seeing his pretty weak stats. He moves past him and loots the heavenly silver breastplate, and also a few bamboo plaques, which he really doesn't need, but his guy might. Seol asks if he's from the Supreme Court, and if he's the head of the Black Fire Squad. Ho confirms as such, so Seol hands him the plaques he looted. If he answers his questions honestly, not only will he have those, but he will get out of here with his head still attached. Without much choice in the matter, Ho agrees. Firstly, Seol asks if he knows anything regarding the other tests, which confuses Ho. Has he not come here with the expectation of this place being what it is? 
Seol asks if this is not just a simple place to take the test, but Ho denies it. He can't believe that a skilled person like him doesn't know this crap. However, he understands now why he chose Shin as his first test. He wants to confirm first that he will actually let him live if he tells him, which Seol already told him. If he answers well, he shall live. With that out of the way, Ho goes on his way to explain that there is a designated order for the tests, and it's impossible to pass if they do not follow said order. This is the first time Seol has heard about this, but Ho doesn't stop there. As he knows, there are four tests. Shin, Eon, Seo, and Pan. Even if he doesn't know the order of these tests, he knows that this test is the last one. Seol is shocked when he hears this, and grabs Ho to confirm what he just said, who is adamant that his words are true. All of this makes Seol wonder, what was the test he took in his previous life? After he finished this one, Ho notes that he only found this out after he came here. He heard the one who manages this place made stuff this way, so that a person can monopolize all of the items. Seol now understands that even though there are countless treasures here, he has not seen a single skilled person come through here from the start. This is because they are taking this test dead last. This connects with what Oma said, that more skilled people will be coming tomorrow morning. This place is made this way, so that they could have a chance at defeating those stronger than them using the treasure items. This is a place where even the weak can fight with their lives on the line. The Shin name really fits this test, as it's a complete slaughterhouse, where the strong come to prey on the weak and narrow-minded. Seol has no choice but to trust this information, at least for now, and asks if he shouldn't get gone. Ho was actually planning to do just that if he does not get the items he wants by midnight. Seol asks why midnight specifically, making Ho question if he will really survive. He explains that tomorrow morning, the others who have finished the three other tests will come to this place, and if he doesn't have the items, he would much rather leave and try his luck elsewhere. Seol asks how strong they really are, and Ho tells him, that they are all recognized by the courts and the nine halls, and among them, the Black Gold Squad leader, Shin Birang, will also be present. Seol knows him. He's one of the few people who represent the seven squads of the Supreme Court. A dangerous guy for sure. Suddenly, the system presents him with a mission, to get rid of Rang, and in exchange, he will get one heavenly dragon pill. Seol is really surprised to see this. Besides that impossible request, it's giving out an amazing reward, as the heavenly dragon pill would give him tons more health and internal energy. Since the reward is so good, he does not have to think about this twice. He will have to get that pill no matter what. He accepts the mission, and now the system notes that his presence has been activated, along with a description of him and what he is doing. Seol also views his status window, and among the usual stats, he can also see the combat power, which is pretty good. Perhaps it's because his mind-reading skill increased in proficiency, but having a new stat isn't bad at all. What is bad is that he can see Rang's stats too, and he has a lot more combat power than he does. Along with those crazy stats, Seol's mind becomes clouded, and he begins doubting himself. What if he can't defeat him? He does not stay like this for long. If he is able to use his luck like he did up until now, he might be able to take this guy down. Ho asks if there's anything else he would like to know, so Seol asks if he knows anything else about the other tests. Ho knows that Pan is judgment, and from what he heard, they release a poison on you if you don't do the task in the given time. As for Eon, he only heard that it's a question, but if one does not answer correctly, they will have their head cut off. Seol has felt that one for himself. He does not need to be reminded of it. The only thing Ho knows about Seo is that they give out a book, and they have to resolve the problems that are within it. With all of that explanation, Ho asks if they are done here, which Seol confirms. So he immediately dips and starts searching for items. Instead of feeling fear or sadness, Seol feels anger at Woon. That fucker didn't give him any information about the tests. He vows to get stronger and kill him with his own two hands. With only a few hours left to spare, Seol decided to loot the yellow building, but the only thing he found useful was a grenade. He knows that there are a lot of treasures out there, but people more powerful than him will arrive soon, so now he must recover his internal energy through chi circulation. This process takes a while to do, but it's better than nothing. He will take whatever help he can get. Seol notices that it's almost dusk, meaning that he must start moving, but that's when he starts hearing tens of screams coming from below the forest. This makes him wonder if the onslaught already started. Was he too focused on his chi circulation to detect them? He really screwed up, but it's not too late to move. So he uses stealth and bolts from rooftop to rooftop, only stopping to catch his breath. But his thoughts are getting to him, much more than he realizes. Suddenly, a lowly man runs along the streets from something, but that something catches up to him, and he falls in the water. If the strike didn't get him, the water surely will. The murders don't stop there, as Seol notices another man trying to hide behind a rock while shaking uncontrollably. The one chasing after them hilts his blade over his shoulder, and as the man mutters something about this being impossible, the attacker raises his blade and strikes. 
Even before the man realizes it, he is cut into two, the attacker grinning while he does it. He tilts his blade back up and calls it as he sees it. They are all a bunch of idiots. Seol becomes frightened by what he is seeing. This is not a test anymore. It's a slaughter. Somewhere nearby, an explosion happens, and three more people fall to the ground. These people are killers. They permeate through the glistening dusk. They violate the peaceful night with the scent of blood. The one who killed them all is none other than Seol's target, Rang, who seems to be enjoying himself. While he runs through the halls, Seol wonders how he was able to survive the night in the past, while people were being slaughtered left and right. Perhaps it was his stealth ability that saved him, or perhaps he was just lucky enough for people to leave him be. When he's just about to enter a room, he stops, as he feels someone is inside. Sure enough, it's Ho, who is asking someone why they're doing something like this, his condition clearly being much worse than before. Seol is surprised to see that he didn't leave yet. It seems that he couldn't control his greed for treasure. The man hunting him down notes that it's just a whim of his, and Seol sees that it's Rang. But why are people from the same court fighting one another like this? Ho warns him that if the Supreme Court finds out about this, he will pay with his own blood. But Rang believes otherwise, as he has finished negotiations long ago. The Supreme Court leader said that he is free to get rid of anyone who dares to seek the treasures. So it's unfortunate for him, but he has to die. In his last moments, Ho feels anger and raises his blade while screaming. But in a split second, Rang closes the gap and finishes him off with a chest strike. He dared to call himself squad leader with those skills. How utterly pathetic. Seol expected the outcome to be like this, since the gap between their skills was too big. Rang loots him, but besides the bamboo plaques, he only finds trash items, as expected of a trashy person, even if he's been watching him for a while. Seol does not get any weak point notification. Is there truly no other way but to face him directly? That's when he remembers something, the grenade he had in his tools. He will distract Rang with this and hopefully create an opening. Since he is already focused on Ho's corpse, now is the time. Unfortunately for him, Seol cannot open his tools tab, as the enemy is already aware of his presence. Seol remains petrified. How did this guy detect his presence even though he was using the stealth skill? In an act of desperation, he decides to bolt out of there. But when he turns the corner, he is met with Rang, who seems to have been waiting for him. Suddenly though, Seol gets the weak point notification, which confuses him to no end. But he will take this heavenly luck for granted. He has four options to choose from, and he wonders what to choose. Perhaps martial arts, but he is too far to deliver any good damage. He decides to move in closer to the opponent, and does so right behind him. Even if Rang reacts, Seol believes that it's too late, and strikes with all of his might. Unfortunately for him, Rang was able to pull his blade out and block the attack, which allows him to reposition himself, but he accidentally steps on the wrong foot, allowing Seol another opportunity to strike his weak point. Now that it has come to this, he decides to use martial arts, more specifically the violent flaming eminence, which proves to be the correct move, as he deals half of Rang's health and damage. However, this has cost him more than half of his internal energy, forcing Seol to move in close with the blade and strike Rang using the white fluorescent arts. He does so again and again, Rang blocking every attack. But even if unhurt, he is still pressured by Seol. He suddenly kicks Rang in the chest and crouches down as he recovers his footing. He will not allow this bastard a single opening, no matter what happens. With his demonic combat arm guard, he is able to use his new wind ability, which Rang barely dodges, but he's still somewhat damaged. Seol refuses to stop, and uses the wind ability combined with the white fluorescent arts to deal a deadly strike, which Rang has no choice but to block. Seol is surprised that he managed to do it, but this gives him another weak spot opportunity, something he was actually aiming for. Unfortunately, the weak point is not only for Rang, but also for him, making Seol fall into despair. He has never been met with such a situation, both a perfect opportunity and a warning at the same time. He has to choose from two tabs now, which increases the stress he's put through, and the timer ticking down slowly does not help. He wonders if it would be better to turn back time three seconds. If he chooses to attack now, he will be able to regress like that. Perhaps then he will see his movements closer. But the problem is his weak point. He cannot know how any of his actions will unfold in this situation. With only two seconds left and his brain racked for any ideas, Seol chooses to attack and face him. Just as he suspected, time goes back by three seconds, allowing Seol to charge in and take a huge risk. Since his weak point window popped up like that, he will stay on guard and not attack. He will let Rang play into his own hand. Rang quickly regains his footing and prepares a deadly strike, one that Seol knows will kill him. But against his eminence, there is not much he can do. So his pupils close in as blood paints the nearby wall in a dark red. The blood did in fact come from Seol, but it was only his cheek that was hurt, as Rang has activated his sword energy. Seol knows that if he wasn't prepared, only death would have awaited him. And even if he was lucky and dealt a mortal blow to him, he would not have been safe either. Fortunately for him, 
Rong has used a lot of internal energy for that, so even if he uses sword energy once again, he will not be able to do it with so much power, meaning that now he has the upper hand, both in health and internal energy. Rong calls him an asshole and demands to know who he is. Seol notes that he's just a bastard below him, which confuses Rang. Is he a part of the Supreme Court? Sol laughs. He does not need to know that, not since he will die anyway. He rushes in with speed and force, and combined with the fact that his stats are still alright, Rang's choices are very limited. Seol knows not to push too hard, even though he has more health, he still has low internal energy, so if Rang hits him once, he will be in danger. Still, he must charge through, and prove himself the better fighter. The system blows up with messages, as they are both attacking each other without an ounce of defense, which turns into a tie. Before the messages appear again, and another tie appears, they both back away from each other, Seol being much worse than he was before, but Rang has one foot in the grave. Seol notices how much of his HP was chunked away, while he could only do little to Rang. If things continue on like this, he will not be able to survive this encounter. Rong sees that he is distracted and moves in for a stab, which forces Seol to block. But that was actually a feint, as Rang redirects his attack into a slash. With only milliseconds to spare, Seol decides to strike first, which was all part of Rang's plan, as he instantly backs away, leaving Seol vulnerable. He gets a warning that Rang found his weak point just as he's about to strike, making him go crazy for a second. These three options differ based on the enemy's distance from him and his movements. If he were to face him, it would require him to get close, but in the case of a strong enemy like this one, that's too dangerous. Fending him off would only place him further than he is now. It's an ideal option based on the enemy's distance and movements. If he were to flee, he could easily dodge this attack, but it might leave him vulnerable to another. Seol looks at the choices and decides to fend him off, which he does somewhat successfully, before he fails and is forced to back away. He was dealt quite a bit of damage, and now Rong has more health and internal energy. He has lost his advantage with this attack. Rang moves in closer, and asks if he can see the difference between them. Even if he gathered a lot of items, this is his limit. There is a gap between worms and the chosen of the gods, and he is not one. Seol knows that he is not just boasting, as Rong's fighting abilities are amazing. He's someone who has trained perhaps all of his life, and is currently carrying out important missions for the Supreme Court. He is also in charge of the Black Gold Squad, and is guaranteed a promotion in the future. However, he should not kid himself here. Does he really think he's the only chosen one? Rong has had enough of this guy, and prepares to end his miserable life. He slashes downwards with Seol managing to dodge the strike, but with a curve and a swerve, the sword energy flows right into his shoulder. Rang does not stop, and pushes his sword energy even harder, allowing him to deal a fatal blow to Seol. He backs away to the wall, but with how much blood he lost and is losing, he can barely see in front of him. Yet Rang's smug expression permeates. As Rang approaches, Seol does nothing, but surprisingly Rang congratulates him. He has fought well for a worm. He will praise him for how much he has managed to push him. Seol knows that he will die if he stays here, so he takes the biggest gamble ever and jumps out of the window. Naturally, Rang feels that he is running away, so he gets after him, ready to strike at any moment. Fortunately, Seol's gamble has paid out, and he gets a weak point opportunity. Seol thinks that it does not take much for this window to appear. It also doesn't matter what position he's in. It is as he predicted. He knows that he can't attack, since he will die either from the attack or the bleeding so he chooses a recovery item, more specifically, a golden potion. After all, surviving right now is more important than winning. With the potion used, his health is recovered and his bleeding is stopped, allowing him to easily deflect Rang's incoming attacks, proving that he can do this. After they both land, Rang becomes fearful, as he was just dying earlier, but he seems fine now. Seol has told him already that he is not the only one who was chosen. With this power boost, Seol is easily able to pummel Rang into a corner, who cannot do anything. And as death closes in on him, he becomes more and more fearful. After Seol deflects his blade, he aims directly at his chest and ends the fight with that strike. Seol breathes heavily before falling to the ground. He has won, although barely. Seol can only laugh. Rang was better than him in most ways. If not all of them, this fight was won only because of his luck. With his mission completed, Seol is rewarded with a heavenly dragon pill as promised, which he can't believe that he is seeing in his inventory. This thing increases both health and ki by over 10,000. It's a miracle item, much better than any treasure out here. Since he got this pill, he will not have a single regret for this life. He should loot what he can from Rang and get out of here. Suddenly, a voice from behind asks if he killed Rang, making Seol grab his blade and turn around. But he is mesmerized by what he sees. A beautiful woman stands before him, who notes that he must not have ambushed him. She really did not expect to see someone with such high skill here. Seol's eyes glisten as he looks at her. Even when she approaches, 
He does not stop looking. He is broken out of his trance by her asking if he's alright. He definitely will not survive the admin core if he is like this. She skips over him and says that he is a master for killing Rang, so she hopes that she will see him sometime again. She is a little bit busy now, so she must leave. Seol knows that by staring at her like that, most people will think that he's dumb or infatuated with her, but there was not much he could do either way, as So Ryong has stats that overshadow Rang's by a large margin. As the moon glistens in the night sky, Seol goes back to his little hiding spot and starts pondering. In his previous life, he left for the admin core after hiding here all night, and now, he has two lives. With his stats so low, he has two choices. Either he uses the pill and gets stronger in this life, or save it for better days, for a better chance at life. If he eats it, he will obtain strength beyond that of even Rang's. However, if by chance the monsters that are lingering around here jump him and he dies, his next life will be extremely bad. Not only will he have to survive what he went through again, but he will be in a state where he can't take down Rang no matter what he does. He decides to save it for a better chance, just as a little rabbit jumps in front of him, reminding him of himself. If he thinks about it, how did he even survive back then? The monsters around here could easily find the others who were hiding and killed them without prejudice. At the time, after spending a single day in this place, he decided to just walk out of the admin core entrance, as there was nothing to do, and nothing standing in his way either. Seol rummages his brain for ideas, but he gets none, deciding instead to put the demonic combat arm guard in the toolbox, as that is the best thing that he got out of this place. Except the pill, of course. For someone who uses sword techniques like he does, this item is not really fitting, but it really contributed to his survival in a few key moments. The armor set he had on is in tatters anyway, so that he can just continue to wear it until it runs out completely. He tries to open the toolbox, but for some reason, it doesn't open, leaving him confused to no end. It appears that the system will not warn him about its features twice. Seol has forgotten that he cannot use the toolbox when someone knows of him, but he remembers when someone notes that they did not expect to find a rat here. With one strike, the whole tree is split in two, Seol barely being able to get out of the way before he is hit too. Unfortunately, the situation he's in now isn't any better, as the guy he is facing is the bastard who is hunting down people like stray dogs. His name is Go Whale. He is the Dragon Squad captain, and has stats that are a bit better than Rang's. Seol damns himself for not remembering that the toolbox doesn't open when in these kinds of situations, he will have to drill that into his mind from now on. He also sees that this guy has similar stats to Rang's, but in his current state, he probably has no chance to defeat him. Whale notices that he must be thinking of a way out of here, but that's useless. He should just accept the fact that he will die. It's much easier that way. Seol gets inspired by his words. Even if he is going to die here, he will at least make this bastard fight for it. He rushes in with his blade unsheathed, ready to fight with everything he's got. But before even moving closer, he gets notified that Whale has found his weak spot, and he's forced to choose. Seol can't believe this. Even before he could swing his sword once, he is already at a disadvantage. This only proves the skill gap between them, but with no other choice, Seol decides to defend. Whale seems to be doing nothing, but with a single lightning fast step, he closes the gap between them, catching Seol by surprise and allowing him to give him a deadly gut kick. Seol falls to the ground completely defenseless, but Whale does not stop there and kicks him in the face next. So hard in fact that it makes Seol skip and fall on his back. With his back utterly exposed, Whale gives him one last strike in the back, dealing a deadly blow to Seol, who only has eight health left and can barely breathe. Whale looks at his pathetic victim. He is wiggling around like a worm, yet he is still clenching that blade, like he could do something with it. It's impressive how long it takes for him to give up, but what can an insignificant worm like him even do at this point? He crouches down to Seol's level and picks him up by the hair. Someone as shitty as he is, should just become what shit is destined to be. Fertilizer. As Whale toys with him, Seol finally seems to understand something. He has thought about this many times, even during something like this, about his life repeating after death, about the reason for him to become stronger, and why he must push himself and stand up in this disgusting place. He will not stop thinking about these things, because if he does, he knows that he will die. Even if he must become fertilizer, he will find a way to survive and get stronger than ever. By some heavenly miracle, Seol activates Ship's sword, and his blade starts to glow, something that surprises the both of them. Because he does not know what is happening, and because he is far too close to the blast, Whale cannot hope to dodge this deadly strike. The mountain range glows as the attack happens, and Whale is left in a detrimental state, as this was a calculated strike. His health is not even a quarter, and his key has fallen by half. As the dust from the blast clears, Seol appears, who has found the strength to keep smiling and hold his blade up no matter how bad things become.
Seol was able to activate Ship's sword because of Whale, who put his head down, two times to the right, and one time to the left. With that, Seol has learned how to activate Ship's sword, allowing him to cake the area in blue light and damage Whale greatly. He can't help but laugh. Who would have imagined that the instructions for using that ability were for his head? Seol tells Whale that he should have stopped hunting while he was still ahead, but he knows that he doesn't have enough health and energy to do anything, so he couldn't properly swing the sword. Seol tells him that he won't be able to get out of this area. The other hunters, that are just like him, will not leave him alone while he is so injured and weak. Whale has had enough of him. His rage is like molten lava, so he activates his sword aura. Seol knows that he is dead. This life was not that bad, since he got to learn quite a few things that will certainly help him in the future. However, an opportunity arises, as Weol has opened himself to a weak spot attack. Seol does not have the strength to fight back. He can barely hold his sword as is. That's when he thinks of doing something else. So he uses the toolbox and summons the grenade. Just as Weol is about to strike him down, the grenade pops up in his face, already lit and ready to blow. The explosion sends Seol flying, but absolutely annihilates Weol, who dies on the spot. Seol is amazed after the blast. Weol was torn to shreds while he was shielded from the blast. Surprisingly, he won, but his wounds are too deep. They are bleeding, so he will die soon. With a single HP left, he crawls to grab Whale's items. If he dies without them, that grenade will be an extreme waste. Suddenly, he remembers the nutrition bar he had, allowing him to get some much-needed HP, but not enough to help him survive. However, this allows him to reach for Whale, getting him a bunch of items. He is glad that he did it. For the moment, he is at peace with his death, but that's when he spots something else. The shadow-severing sword that he always uses. He must grab it before it's too late, but time is cruel to him. So he dies, sending him back to the save he made, where he is talking to Gi, and he bites his lip as he chooses to become his core warrior. Gi respects his option as usual and tells him to go ahead with his duties as he leaves, but Seol stops him, as he wants to ask him one simple thing. Gi curiously stops, prompting Seol to explain that he has come to know some information by pure coincidence, though it is information that is hard for him to speak about. Gi tells him that he has already boarded the boat, he cannot be afraid of the upcoming waves, and he should speak his mind without worry. Seol needs to make sure of one thing here. So he asks Gi, what would he like him to do if he happened upon the spy who was won over by the other disciples, and is now watching over him closely? After a bit of pondering, Gi notes that it's pretty obvious what he should do. Whoever is unfortunate to stand in his position, as soon as they become the heavenly demon disciple, they get tangled up in issues they do not even want to be a part of. It's been the same for him from the very beginning. It's really sad to think about now. Seol keeps his mouth shut, but thinks about Gi. He is the Earth Demon, a martial artist who is a part of the top 100 in the official ranking of the demon cult, but he is also someone unable to exert influence or show his power. He was able to figure this out just by talking. He knows that this guy, calm as he may seem, is fighting thousands of secret battles. Gi remembers his name for good and orders him, if he gets even a clue regarding that spy on his way to the martial administration, to come to him immediately, as he is going to the Yu Wun Palace right now, and that's where he will find him. Seol knows about that place. Yu Wun Palace is a resting area restricted only for the disciples of the Heavenly Demon. Normal martial artists do not dare approach it, because they know that they will be instantly killed. Gi also adds something else. If he captures that traitor alive, things will be much better for them. Seol understands, but wonders why catching him alive would be better. Perhaps he knows how to get info out of him. He goes to the Xi'an Il Library basement, where he starts seriously thinking about all of this. He mentioned the spy to Gi so that he would not have to go to the admin core. He must think of a way around that place in this life. The charming treasures of that place should still be in their place. But after knowing what comes after midnight, that path is far too dangerous to set foot on ever again. What he should do now is catch Woon. But before that, he has to do something about these terrible stats. Unfortunately, he doesn't have access to the miracle pills he used in his past life. That was really a waste of resources now that he thinks about it. But perhaps Whale had something that would help him. First is his martial spirit blade, a high-grade cuirass, which blocks some amount of damage completely. A blood ice rock moss, basically the same effect as a pill, increases health and key moderately. The thousand-year-old hundred shadow fruit, which is also amazing, as it boosts health and key by over 3,000. Seol is glad that he found something to use in this life, and he uses the moss and shadow fruit right away, boosting his stats pretty significantly. Seol is not done yet, however, as he feels it's time to use the heavenly dragon pill, which increases his stats by a ton, to the point that it makes him glow and allows air to flow around him. He feels like his body is crushing its own limits. This is a phenomenon that occurs when several dozen small veins burst into place, and the inner power created by that goes through the lower key region to eminence out of him. Perhaps because of Seol's sharp senses, 
but now he can hear someone walking above him, someone lifting an object, and even their breathing. His mind reading skill goes from imitation to beginner level, and he also remembers all the demonic arts he will need for the future battle. The last thing he has to do is prove that he can use ship sword. He tilts his head down, two times to the right, and one time to the left, which immediately activates the great ship sword, making him overflow with power and allowing his strikes to become extremely deadly. Seol is still amazed by this ability, but with this, he has a guarantee. This life will be completely different than the others. He can feel it. Seol continues to train in the basement of the library, to the point where half a day passes. His current task is to learn how to use the great ship sword in the fastest and most efficient way. Even if this martial art is amazing, he has found a critical weakness in it. For him, who is a right-handed swordsman, it creates the restriction of needing to use his left hand instead. Even if he does something about the position of the sword, the activation process is the bigger issue here. He managed to learn the movements through sheer luck, but it takes too long for him to do them. The enemy won't just sit around and let him tilt his head around the place like a maniac. Seol wonders if he can combine with the white fluorescent demonic arts somehow, but that's when Hong appears and asks why he's making so much noise all of a sudden. Seol gathers that it's the noise he made while studying the ability, so he apologizes for the inconvenience. Hong would still like his question answered. Just what was he doing that was making all that noise? Seol plays it off by saying that he was just lightly training himself, but this sudden appearance provides him with an opportunity. He can kill Hong and take his life away but also request to become his dog, which will upgrade his battle type. Seol wonders what that is, and if it's even worth the humiliation it entails. But that's when Hong prepares a bite of the apple he was eating and spits it at Seol, who dodges it easily thanks to his improved reflex. Hong is surprised that he dodged that. He really doesn't have an ounce of common sense, does he? Seol takes the next one, but it angers him quite a bit. Should he just kill this fucker and be done with it? He decides to let go of that anger. He cannot kill him now. He must think about everything first, as killing him now is very easy for him. But the events that will happen after killing him are a variable he cannot risk. Who knows what will happen? But isn't killing this guy his first priority, now that he thinks about it? He apologizes for being so rude, but Hong spits on him with a piece of chewed up apple. He got really lucky today, as he was bored because he was too free, and some bastard who kept going back and forth throughout the library was annoying him too. Since they both have nothing to do, how about they get acquainted with each other? Seol's calm anger encourages him to pull his blade and cut this guy into tiny meat cubes, but he decides to hold on to this new option, even if it might not be worth it. The strong are always at the top, and everyone follows their words to the T. It is a rule ingrained in the very roots of the demonic cult, and it is clearly stated that everyone must follow this no matter what. It is normal for the higher-ups to kill underlings, or even torture them, and nobody will bat an eye. So now, even if Hong is harassing him like this, he has no justification to stop it. Even if he is the stronger one, he has no status. The next day, bright in the morning, Seol is out cleaning the local shitter which makes him think of the worst ways to kill that bastard. He was ordered to clean the outhouse for the entire night and then empty the shit in the morning, although this has gained him a doggy token, which he needs aid of. Seol is mad, just like his time with Myung. He cannot escape fecal matter no matter where he goes. After he finishes this one, he has six more to do, which is easy to say, but this makes him wonder if the reward is even worth it. What even is a battle type? Suddenly someone rushes to the outhouse, apparently having eaten something bad for breakfast. Seol gets a status screen, showing him that he's the administrator of the third floor of the Xion-il library. But why is he coming here so fast? He screams that there's someone in here, which the administrator has heard about from Hong. He is the dog he forced this shitty work onto. What bad luck for him. Seol confirms he is currently carrying out that task, which he is grateful for. The administrator pulls down his pants as he congratulates him, but he's busy now, so he should get out of the way. Seol can only stare at the dark crevice staring back at him. As it opens up, and a brown shower overtakes him. After this encounter, Seol goes to wash up in the river, which he does diligently, to make sure that there is no smell attached to him anymore. As he finishes, he wonders how to kill those two fuckers. First, he will beat them to the point of near death, and then toss their heads in the shit water, where he will also stomp on their heads until they become mush. That sounds really pleasant. The fresh odor of the river water leaves him, allowing the musky smell of the shit to protrude again from him. Seol can't believe this, and he screams out in rage, he will make sure to get his revenge. After washing up completely, which took a while, he returns to the basement of the library, where Hong is talking with the administrator, who notes that he's doing an expert job at cleaning the outhouses. Seol feels that he saw this scene in the past. It's like the Lord of the Supreme Court and the Holy Deity Lord all over again. These fuckers are planning to humiliate him, but as much as he would like to cave their faces in, he must hold it. He explains that he cleaned up pretty well, granting him another doggy token. 
Hong is pleased to hear that and orders him to get some water so that both him and the administrator can wash. Before leaving, the administrator stops him, as he hopes he scrubbed his hands well. He can't have the water smell, can they? Seol tells him not to worry. He has cleaned up extremely well. He vows to kill those laughing fuckers in the most brutal way imaginable. But that's when someone arrives that makes both of them stand up and rush past him. They both greet the person, and Seol is mesmerized once again by her visage. However, why is she here? Even with that question in mind, he cannot help but stare at Ryong's beauty. She asks if Sir is inside, which Hong denies. He has left for Yu Won Palace not long ago. Ryong understands, but that's when she catches Seol in her eye and wonders who he is. Hong tells her that he's a lackey from the Supreme Court, and currently he is managing the basement storage. He is really nothing special, so she should pay him no mind, as he does not deserve it. Ryong wonders if that's true, as it appears that there's something fun about him. Seol feels the same as he did when he first met her, to think that just her look was able to stop his heart from beating. She suddenly approaches, which confuses the two old coots to no end. She asks Seol for his name, who shyly responds. Ryong notes that his name is quite nice, but as for how he ended up staying in this place, she does not really need to know. Before finishing her sentence, she suddenly recoils back and says that there must be a reason. Seol knows that she smelled it. He knows that no matter how much he washes, he cannot get this damn smell out of him. All because of those two dog-looking fuckers. Ryong waves him goodbye, which he also does. But suddenly, the system urges him to select from three options. Even if this is plenty surprising already, Seol is extremely shocked at the choices he has. Why the hell is he cursed with these? This is probably not a coincidence. It was always like this. And even if most of these events come out of nowhere, they have an effect that will affect the near future. He will be dragged into danger without doing anything, but he will also be rewarded somewhere. He can figure out that these choices don't always relate to this life, but sometimes, to the next one. With one second left, he chooses the first option, asking her to go out with him. This surprises everyone there, but Ryong laughs. As she expected, he really is fun. Seol gathers that this was a pretty okay choice from her expression. He is glad that she is not hostile, even after such a rude comment from someone as lowly as him. Unfortunately for him, he gets to choose from the two other options now, which makes dark thoughts circle his mind. He's about to lose his marbles. It's just like with Gi. This is something he cannot avoid, so he must accept the result of the right choice. He wonders what to do, but that's when he thinks about something. Perhaps, all of this time, he was wrong. He has always made the decision to not choose the worst, but the least bad choice. However, the least bad choice instead turns into the worst one. With that in mind, the worst choice should become the best one. This is all heavy assumption coming from him. But with two seconds left, he breathes in and asks if she would like to spend a hot night with him. Naturally, Ryong's expression changes. Seol was prepared for this, but he can still fix it. He knows that babbling like this is not normal at all. He is flailing around trying to get better every day. But as she can see, he is still in this state. Even now, after getting covered in all types of matter, he could not say a single word to anyone. That is why he's saying this straightforwardly, even if it will not work. He wants to create a reason for him to live. It could be a huge humiliation for her, he knows. But to him, meeting her has been a huge blessing from the gods. Perhaps Seol was venting because his life has been a repeat of killing and dying, and the sudden swelling of his sorrow got to him. He started talking to appease her anger but instead he rambled on about a point nobody knew he was trying to make. He has spilled everything to her, so all he can do now is wait. Ryong notes that it wasn't abhorrent, rather, it was overly honest. Seol wonders if she's truthful now. Was she not offended by his words? Both Hong and the administrator jump on him with harsh words. How dare he slander the lady's status? They will rip out his dirty tongue. As they keep swearing, Ryong becomes annoyed, and she says that it's a bit too noisy. She strikes both of them down in a split second before gracefully landing. Seol is amazed by her abilities, but with the same speed, she appears next to Seol. He should make it true that he will become as he wants, and after that, they should escape this hell together. With that, she jumps away and notes that they will see each other again whenever the opportunity comes. Seol didn't expect one of the main cult personnel to describe this place in that way. Who is this woman? In the end, life is a sum of decisions. They say that when one collects the result of those sums, fate is created. It is often said that fate does not change. But he felt that with this choice, the future of this life and the past ones has changed. A phrase that he has never seen in the past, a phrase that only existed in books, appeared over Ryong, love. Later that day, Seol does the laundry, but the injuries Hong put on him are starting to hurt. He expected to be beaten up, but those bastards really had no mercy, as he is still sore. However, since he was in their rooms, he was able to get a few items, like a uniform and another bomb, which confuses the enemy. 
He also got the understanding of swordsmanship books. He will make sure to use these things diligently. He now has four doggy tokens, so this request will soon be over. All he has to do is endure a little bit longer. He also thinks about Ryong, as he never expected to meet someone around here with the same opinion as him. The demonic arts are martial arts that eliminate rationality out of men and promote greed for more power. In the main cult, perhaps because of this primordial desire, they get addicted as they accept more power and become brainwashed to crave even more. However, somebody who rejects that poison is suspicious of everything and tries to find something better. Mutants like he is appear in this place sometimes. However, he did not imagine her to be one of those mutants. The wish to get stronger is something he set because he did not want to get wrapped up in another disgusting situation. But now, he has an even clearer goal in mind. For now, he will take everything, even if it's a weak power that is pitied. After he grows and the opportunity rises, he will escape with Ryong out of this place. From the bottom of his heart, he prays that the day when that happens comes soon. Thank you for watching. See you next time.